Hey, uh, welcome uh, everyone back to the second day of the workshop or actually including tutorials this is the third day and uh, yesterday we had uh, a wonderful presentation about nanotechnology and also uh, the uh, instrumentation demo I hope you enjoy that and today we are going to shift the focus a little bit uh, uh, and in the morning we are going to talk about public health and the aerosol and uh, 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 today, together with Dr. Uh, Robert Makush, uh, we are moderating uh, this session. And so the first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Don Milton. For anyone who work on uh, respiratory uh, virus aerosol transmission, uh, everyone knows him because he's like the king in this uh, uh, respiratory uh, aerosol uh, infection transmission. And uh, Dr. Milton is a professor in environmental health at the University of uh, Maryland. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Milton for his talk. Thank you, CY. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry I'm not down in Florida enjoying some warmer weather, um, but uh, you'll see as we get into this why that's not possible today, among other things. And hopefully my voice will hold out. My grandson gave me a cold for Christmas. It's pretty amazing to realize that it's been 20 years since this slide uh, appeared as a figure in the New England Journal of Medicine in the spring of 20, 2004, 2004, uh, it, as an accompaniment to the article about the Amoy Gardens uh, outbreak where hundreds of people were infected with SARS uh, due to a toilet aerosol. And we tried to capture Chad Roy and I in this, uh, a description of all of the steps of source transport dispersion and deposition in the human airways uh, that constitute what we could call the aerobiological pathway of transmission. And we, in this graphic, tried to capture that there are distributions of sizes and that these sizes of aerosol particles can be quite large. Um, and that then there's uh, a process happening through, as it travels through the air. This, the aerosols are dynamic because they're liquid and uh, they change size. Um, there's physical decay. There's also biological decay. And there's been recently some very exciting work coming out of Bristol, uh, looking at the determinants of this biological decay. Uh, and, include, and it turns out that carbon dioxide is playing probably a much bigger role than we had thought in that biological decay and is perhaps part of what we had been calling um, outdoor air factor is that it has very low CO2 and results in alkaline biological aerosols. I'm not going to have time to get into that today. But then again, on the other end, there is a size distribution as to where things go in the airways. And you all probably have covered a lot of that elsewhere in this course. The next question is, where do people generate aerosols from? And in the mid to late 2000s, a lot of progress was made on understanding that there's a mechanism of aerosol formation in the airway where airways close. And when we speak for a long period of time without taking a breath, we get to very low lung volumes. And then we take a deep breath. And what happens when we do that is that airways close. And when they close, they form a liquid bridge that then bursts like a bubble. And when we inhale, we pull those droplets in and on the next breath, exhale far more droplets. So this slide from Lydia Morwaska, whose lab did much of this really good work. It was also uh, similar work being done by Anna Karn Olin at Gothenburg and some in my lab in, in Massachusetts at the time that um, there, there are basically three modes of respiratory. There's uh, very small particles that can stay suspended for quite a long time and penetrate deeply into the human airways. And 
Some of this is coming from bronchial fluid burst, some from laryngeal vibration modes, and others on the very large end from oral articulation mode. But one of the problems that's arisen is that early in the pandemic, there were a lot of people saying, oh, well, we measured how much is in nasal secretions and in saliva, and therefore that's the concentration in the air, and it must be vanishingly small and mostly in very big droplets. And therefore spray is most important. Well, the problem with that is that biological uh, microbiology, it, it doesn't work that way. That um, microorganisms concentrate in fluid films and in those thin films that, concentra- that break up as you breathe, and there's also a similar process happening in the larynx, the microorganisms concentrate in the, at the surface, and so there are much higher concentration at this CF here than they are in the bulk fluid. The concentration in the film is much higher than in the bulk fluid. And as a result, the concentration in the fine particle aerosols is higher than you would expect based on measuring the concentration in bulk saliva or nasal swabs. And that is probably a reason why spray drops are not as dominant a mode of transmission besides the fact that the target zone is very small, whereas by inhalation, you get a much larger target zone. And so we can divide um, transmission in uh, respiratory viruses into a touch, spray, and inhalation mode. And some of my colleagues argue that we should call spray droplets because the medical profession has been calling that droplet transmission for years. But the fact is that drops drop and droplets like fog droplets and cloud droplets float in the air. And I think I'm an MD, but I think the MDs have it wrong and we need to teach them how to use the language correctly. And we're never going to get out of the woods if we continue to use their terrible definitions. So in summary, the aerobiological pathway for communicable respiratory infections is elusive because you you can't grab a piece of air easily and show what's in it. It's intangible. And the because of this concentration mechanism from bubble films, there's a lot more in the fine aerosol than you would think based on the volume of those small aerosol droplets. And it's better to think about the transfer process as Hugo Lee has laid out than to try and um, call it contact. Well, what's contact? I mean, contact is a nebulous thing. We use that term in so many different ways. Droplet doesn't describe that it's a spray and um, airborne um, may miss the point that it's inhalation. And in fact, the WHO and CDC right now are trying to redefine the word airborne. And uh, some of us have been struggling with that, Um, but uh, they wanna talk about through the air. And by that, they mean spray and inhalation exposure. And then muddy the important fact that that has really big implications for how we should protect against it. So that's a big struggle going on right now. So I want to give you a little history of how we got there. Uh, Aerobiology really starts with Pasteur in um, uh, his work in in the 19th century. Um, Looks like I left off the date for when those papers were published, but he debunked the theory of spontaneous generation with his swan neck uh, flasks showing that air could get in, but living organisms didn't. And the implication being that there are living organisms floating in the air. Koch studied um, uh, anthrax, and it was really through the study of anthrax that he developed his famous uh, Koch's postulates that 
microorganism must be found in all cases of disease, must be isolated from the host, grown in pure culture, and then reproduce the original disease when introduced into a host. And it must be found um, in the experimental host that is thus infected. Now, today we understand that there are organisms that don't grow by themselves and they won't grow in pure culture and they won't grow outside of the specific milieu. And of course, this um, is difficult to interpret for viruses as well. He was focused on bacteria. And his student, Flugi, uh, talked about identifying droplets. He had people gargle serratia marcescens and then speak and show that he could pick this up um, uh, across uh, a large room. It went around that time. Uh, it, was, it was done where the, the somebody spoke at the site where the uh, prime minister speaks in parliament in, in London and showed that you could pick up the bacteria at the seat of a backbencher. But he was only able to infect guinea pigs very close to a TB patient. He could not infect them farther away. And uh, it's not clear why that experiment failed. Uh, Chapin, building on that, though, said, well, you know, we've got to stop people from believing in this uh, miasmas and, and pestilential vapors. And he said, you know, contact is obvious. Um, and so anybody wants to say it's not contact, then the burden of proof rests on them. Um, and the reason that there were cases popping up that you couldn't show were connected to a previous clinical case was because there were asymptomatic cases walking around. And he downplayed tuberculosis inhalation, even though he thought that it might be transmitted by air. But given Flugi's failure to show long distance transmission, he thought that it prudent to deny it because undue emphasis laid upon the invisible and therefore terrifying infection in the air seriously interferes with rational measures for the restriction of the disease. He was basically worried that any evidence, any, any statement from an authority that airborne infection was happening would reduce the number of baths people took. So our understanding of airborne infection really rests on these four giants, William Wells, Richard Riley, Credle Mills, and Mildred Weeks Wells. Unfortunately, there are very few pictures of Mildred Wells. This one from her medical school graduation yearbook here is about the only thing uh, anybody's been able to find. Uh, and one of the key experiments that Wells did was to generate size specific aerosols. He had a nice aerosol generator and he could generate TB aerosol, mycobacteria tuberculosis aerosols in large droplets and in fine droplets. And he was able to show that only the fine droplets resulted in his exposed rabbits developing TB. And here you can see the lung full of TB exposed to a similar concentration, but of aerosol in large droplets and other rabbit is lungs are clean because they don't penetrate to reach the target tissue. Um, and um, that it was key, but medical profession then said, well, these big things are, are not airborne. But what was really going on was not that they weren't suspended in the air, but they were not reaching the alveoli where the target cell lives in a rabbit and a human. So Wells and Riley then built on that with working with Settle Mills, who um, did all of the work of testing the approximately 150 or so, 180 guinea pigs that were maintained in this chamber, receiving air from a patient room uh, over a period of two years, uh, and were able to demonstrate that um, they could transmit 
tuberculosis from patients in the Baltimore VA hospital up to the guinea pigs in this, these chambers in the roof. And they had to do a lot of engineering to that building to get that to work. And you can see that there were a lot of guinea pigs, every one of these guinea pigs being skin tested every month. And there is a very small number of infections happening but they calculated that the number of infections happening were sufficient to have explained the attack rate in house staff in hospitals. And these studies now have been replicated 60 to 70 years later uh, in these two papers here, one in Peru uh, and the other in South Africa. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Wells has also did some fantastic studies. This is from Wells and Wells and all, uh, in Philadelphia schools, where they show that upper room UV reduced the transmission uh, of measles. Normally, uh, the primary grades have very high attack rates because they haven't had measles before. This is in the 40s, long before vaccines. And the upper grades are relatively immune, and they reversed the pattern, whereas now the children in the upper grades got infected. But this was done in Germantown, Philadelphia, where children were walking to school um, and playing outdoors and not exposed to one another in indoor environments outside of the school. When this was then replicated in upstate New York, um, all the classes with ultraviolet lights in them in one school and those in two other schools with no or just some of the classes having ultraviolet lights. Um, you had big epidemics here and you didn't have a big epidemic, but the area under the curve ends up the same. And what's going on here, you flattened the curve. Now that is a significant effect. But what it means is that there's transmission happening outside of those irradiated environments. And note that in the schools where only half of the classes have it, it didn't do anything. That is the importance of the ubiquity of aerosol transmission. If you aren't controlling all of the environments where people are exposed, you have very little impact. With the advent of measles vaccines, an interest in this waned. Uh, there was an interesting uh, report about, it wasn't really a study, but they had one of the McLean who had worked with Riley and Wells in Baltimore had gone to Livermore, California VA and had installed UV in a wing of the hospital where new TB patients were admitted till they'd been on therapy for at least a month they were, maybe it was six months back then. Then they were allowed to move to the other wing of the hospital until they were considered cured. And the healthcare workers rotated between the different wings and the healthcare workers had an 18% attack rate of influenza during the 1957, 58 pandemic. But the patients who were not allowed to leave this wing and their only exposure was in there, whether it to, 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 to healthcare workers or visitors, um, had a much lower attack rate, a tenfold reduction in attack rate. But the argument has been, well, it's all really spray and, you know, it's not really that important. Beds might have been farther apart, in spite of the, the, that we know that TB is airborne and that's what they were doing here. This thing as well with influenza, it's probably droplets. The other sobering thing is this study from Mildred Wells the wet in Westchester County, where she looked at the flow of measles and chickenpox throughout the county and found that over a period of two years in which she traced every chickenpox case and every measles case to figure out where they got exposed and compared the town of Mount Kisco and Mount Pleasant where Mount Pleasant, she had installed upper room UV in the 
um, public schools, the parochial schools, the Catholic church, the Boy Scout and Girl Scout meeting places, the soda fountain, the movie theater, every public place in town. And they had suppressed measles until the last month when there was a very wet month and a big epidemic in New York City washing up through Westchester County. And they didn't suppress measles overall, but they had suppressed chickenpox quite effectively. But one of the things that's interesting to note here is that home exposures in Pleasantville accounted for 30%. Um, and uh, the classroom exposures only accounted for 20%, whereas that was reversed here in Mount Kisco. Uh, and you see a similar pattern here of those who are infected, only 12% got chicken pox exposure at school, whereas 33% did in Mount Kisco. So you can shift where people get it, but it's very difficult to suppress something as contagious as measles or Omicron by selectively irradiating public environments. Another aspect of airborne infection that's important to realize is that the route of infection makes a big difference. Now we know with anthrax, this is so important that we talk about cutaneous anthrax and inhalation anthrax as separate diseases. Cutaneous anthrax can be terrible as it was in this baby who was placed on a counter where an anthrax letter had been opened at a New York uh, TV station. Um, or it can be pretty limited, as in this farmer who put the chain that he had been using to drag a dead cow around on his neck to stretch it over to his truck to hook it up. Um, but if but once this appears, you can treat it with antibiotics and you survive. But if you get inhalation anthrax and do not get treated before you start getting hyalur lymph node infection and pneumonia. You're dead, doesn't matter, it's too late. That is anisotropic, the root of infection matters. And I argue that smallpox was anisotropic. This is a panel from uh, the Compendium of the World's Knowledge of Smallpox published by WHO and edited by, among others, D.A. Henderson, uh, at the end of the pandemic uh, smallpox eradication program, showing in China uh, a, 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 an, a variolator sticking smallpox scabs up the nose of someone. In India, it was done by inoculating the skin, which then was carried to England by British army and diplomats, and then later came to the United States. So the George Washington was variolated, and he variolated the Continental Army when there was a smallpox outbreak in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And it seemed that this uh, local uh, application was much less likely to cause mortality than the normal, natural route of infection. I argued with D.A. Henderson for years uh, about, well, that means the normal route, the natural route can't be just drops sprayed into the nose. I never won that argument and he's gone now, but um, I think that there's more data to suggest that this is true in viruses. In this case, influenza dose makes a difference. Infectious dose uh, for humans by inoculation with, with aerosols is around one tissue culture infectious dose. And it reproduces classic influenza-like illness with fever and cough, sometimes with prolonged wheezing, nausea, and vomiting. But intranasal inoculation requires a few hundred TCID 50 and doesn't produce symptoms at that dose. To produce uh, influenza-like symptoms required something on the order of 10 to the fifth, and those symptoms are moderate, and there's very, very little fever, if any, uh, and cough or sore throat. So 
moving on, um, some of my work folk has focused around uh, a device we developed for uh, collecting influenza virus aerosols directly from exhaled breath, as you see here, uh, with my colleague uh, Samaya Yosefi sitting inside the booth. This is a humidified booth, and then the there's a five micron impactor. We have a steam generator and a heat exchanger, which then grows the droplets. And the key thing about this is that it's sampling at about 130 liters a minute. That allows us to capture all the breath, get a decent capture velocity at the entrance here, so that we're getting everything that the person is exhaling, and that they can wear a mask or sing or talk um, and while, they're, while we're collecting it. And we were able to then culture the virus from those fine aerosol particles, getting up to a thousand culturable viruses in half an hour from one patient and um, on average, um, something in, in the range of 50 per half hour. Now, if you're putting out 50 in a half hour and the infectious dose is one, it might be pretty important. And this guy uh, was uh, quoted on this TV show in February 12th, 2018, saying what this machine tells us is that it can spread by aerosol. Fauci knew what was going on well before this pandemic started. One of the big issues has been Langmuir's postulates, which is my name for this publication of his at a conference proceedings in 1966. And what he was saying was, what's essential about being able to prove that something is transmitted by a given route is you have to be able to eliminate that route and show that that consistently prevents transmission. And to fill the gap requires isolation, quarantine studies, where you can do this under controlled conditions. Because as we've seen, people walking around are gonna get exposed, exposed all over the place. And uh, these randomized controlled trials are considered the gold standard of evidence by in, uh, the evidence-based medicine uh, crowd, even though they put too much weight on these studies when they're poorly designed. Rhinovirus studies were done during the 1970s and 80s and came up with opposite conclusions. The Wisconsin group decided that it was rhinovirus transmission was all airborne. And here's an example of a participant unable to touch his face while playing cards. And the Virginia group decided it was all by touch because they couldn't get any airborne transmission. Neither of them measured ventilation, although the Wisconsin group apparently caulked all the windows and taped up everything to reduce ventilation to the maximum extent. Virginia reports doing no such thing. There's been one randomized controlled trial of influenza transmission done in 2013 and published in 2020. Um, the only study of such a, a virus transmission to use ventilation measurements, but we couldn't detect any virus in the air using Bill Lindsley's samplers. And um, RSV has been shown to be transmitted in hospitals to cuddlers, but not to people elsewhere in the room, but there have been no viral me aerosol measurements in those studies. That EMIT-1, the Evaluating Modes of Influenza Transmission 1, results one zero conversion, no positive PCRs in that study where we had 1,500 parts per million CO2 and we couldn't detect virus in the air. We could detect a little bit in the breath, but only 20% of the inoculated donors, these are artificially inoculated donors, were producing enough that we could detect anything in the Gesundheit machine. So we are now trying to remedy that situation doing evaluating modes of influenza transmission too. And uh, we plan to use donors with natural community acquired infections we have air hygiene inventor interventions rather than just one condition. We'll have low ventilation with high CO2 and high air hygiene with filtration and UV. One of the other things that happened in that study was that uh, the, the person who was in the room monitoring events was wearing a pamper, so they were cleaning the air. Um, and 
This study also includes uh, right. development of advanced technologies, and uh, this is what we had this week when we had a donor come in Monday evening. The first thing we did, we didn't do breath right away, so let's get them in and expose people. They had a rapid test done for influenza B, and so they were in there for half an hour. There was one donor and eight recipients and two uh, staff people. We hit about 2,000 parts per million. And the next morning, somebody came in to clean the room, and then we had an exposure events during the day where we were maxing out here around 3,600 parts per million. And then we had another exposure event here. But by this time, we got the results from this morning, the morning before, person didn't have flu. They have coronavirus 229E. So, uh, Don, Don, uh, sorry, it's uh, we have to wrap up very quickly. Okay, so this is this is the last slide. Aim at two's challenges. We are retrofitting an old hotel. It's hard to time the flu season. Well, the quarantine we did last February got no flu cases because there weren't any anywhere. And even now, when supposedly there's a lot of flu around, it's very hard to get a flu case into the hotel. Uh, the study's also underfunded. EMIT-1 was a one-year set of quarantines for $10 million. We're supposed to do four years of quarantines and develop new bioaerosol technology over five years with $15 million, 10 years later. It's a real challenge. So that's the end of my show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, this is wonderful lectures on the history of the respiratory virus transmission. I really have learned a lot. Unfortunately, we are running out of time for this one. So we are going to leave the uh, questions to the end. We're going to move on to the uh, next presentation. Uh, good morning, everybody. I will declare that I am not uh, an engineering faculty member, but uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, up at, at Yale with uh, Professor Kai Chen, who is your uh, next speaker, uh, a colleague of mine, and so good morning, uh, Kai. Um, he is um, at Yale uh, in epidemiology, uh, environmental health. Um, he uh, works in the intersection of climate change, air pollution, and um, human health, and in that role serves as the director of, of uh, research in climate change uh, and health. In 2016, he received his PhD in environmental science and engineering from uh, Nanjing uh, University. Uh, and this morning, Kai will be discussing his uh, current research efforts. So uh, welcome, Kai. I was hoping to see you in person, but uh, I understand uh, flights are difficult. So uh, good morning and uh, welcome. Thanks for the very nice introduction, Bob. And uh, thanks again for the uh, invitation. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here with you uh, due to the storm. Um, um, but I'm very glad to uh, have this pleasure to share with you some of our research on uh, the health effects of particular matter air pollution and the climate change. Um, so talking about climate change, actually, early this week, uh, the European um, um, uh, Climate Service uh, uh, Agency has confirmed that 2023 is the warmest year on record and they found that the average uh, uh, global temperature was about 1.48 degrees Celsius, above the pre-industrial level. That is very close to the 1.5 degrees Celsius of the Paris uh, climate agreement. So with a warming climate, we have seen from our own uh, experience that all these extreme weather events are more frequent, including storms, floods, heat waves, drought events as well as um, raging Wi-Fi across the world. So here, just showing some of the two major events last year. One is the Wi-Fi events in Lahaina, uh, really burning the town. And then another is the Eastern Canadian Wi-Fi that um, um, transfers a lot of Wi-Fi smoke to the East Coast. And it makes people uh, realize that, you know, Wi-Fi smoke export is not a Western US specific problem anymore. And the World Attribution, World Attribution Project uh, quickly did a, a what we call a detect attribution study. And they found that 
crunch end have been more than doubled the likelihood of, of these extreme fire weather conditions in the eastern Canada. So with crunch end, how does it impact our house? Uh, it can directly impact our house through all these extreme events, including the storm that you know prevent us many of us coming in person, but also indirectly through worsened water quality, air pollution, land use changes, ecological system changes. And all these direct and indirect impacts combined together with our social dynamics, including age, sex, social economic status, and racial and ethnic disparities, they can impact not only on our physical health, but also on our mental health. Uh, so today I will be mainly focusing on particular matter air pollution as the one the, the indirect pathway that climate change can impact health. Um, and I will focus on mostly on the, the epidemiological research and findings on how air, particular matter air pollution impacts our, our health. Uh, with some um, of later um, 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 presentation on the role of risk ethnicity in um, the air pollution housing effects. So when we talk about air pollution and when we talk about content, we have to talk them together because these are not two isolated issues. They in fact, what we always say, the two sides of the same coin. This is because First of all, majority of the, these air pollutants can impact the climate. Um, for example, sulfate we know has a cooling effect. When you have volcano eruptions, it cools the global temperature. But on the other hand, there are other uh, um, particles or uh, um, uh, gases pollutants that has the warming effect. For example, the ozone, I mean, uh, ozone pollution or uh, the black carbon, um, they all can uh, have a uh, warming potential. And on the other hand, we know that the sources of the emission for both greenhouse gas and air pollution are largely from the same source, which is the fossil fuel uh, combustion. And that means that if we control these common emission sources, we could both mitigate climate change, but in the meantime, we can have immediate benefits of air quality in the house. So this is what we call the co-benefits of controlling both uh, greenhouse gas emission and air pollution emission. And that health benefits is more relevant to, to policy to the public because we're not talking about the health benefits by the end of this century to maybe um, your children or your grandchildren, but we are talking about immediate benefits that we can see um, from today. So over the past few decades, uh, epidemiological scientists uh, working on air pollution has really greatly advanced our understanding of how air pollution, particularly the fine particular matter, can impact our health. In the beginning, we know that air pollution, um, the aerosols can lead to significantly increased uh, mortality and morbidity risk for respiratory illnesses, including asthma, and that leads to lung cancer. Uh, but later we found out that the smaller particles like the PM25 can go into the lungs and some even smaller particles can circulate around the body. Uh, that triggers systematic inflammation, oxidative stress, leads to increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And later we found that effects goes beyond uh, just, just um, cardiovascular system goes to increase uh, uh, increased risk of hypertension, diabetes, Worst outcomes, et cetera. So today, I think of, uh, what I will uh, talk most about is, as epidemiologists, how do we actually know or estimate the health effect of, of air pollution? Um, if you follow the uh, studies of global uh, burden disease studies, you probably know the headline that people were talking about is that particular matter pollution kills about six to seven million people per year. And that number is likely on the same level of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and, but it kills people in what people say a slow motion and more quietly. And we don't, it, it does not deserve much attention as the attention that we're addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. However, if you look at a death certificate that was literally saying that the air pollution is the leading cause of 
individual's deaths. So that was not happening until 2020. So in, in UK, uh, on a UK girl's death certificate, air pollution was first time um, marked as the leading cause of death. So you see, we know for actually decades, air pollution kills millions of people, but it was only until 2020 that for individual person's death certificate, we know air pollution is the leading cause. So what is the difference? Um, that actually, because we are asking a different question. So for epidemiological research, we are asking on average, at the population level, are there more people dying or having a certain disease on more polluted days, rather than at the individual level to look at the causal um, deaths, uh, ca cause of deaths. So to address this question in air pollution epidemiology, uh, there are probably two types of designs. One is the random control trial um, or um, um, uh, some of the controlled human exposure chamber studies that was illustrated in the, the prior, uh, previous talk. But unfortunately, these type of experimental studies are fairly uh, rare in epidemiology due to various reasons. And as such, most of the current air pollution epidemiology relies on observational studies. And we can actually divide the current observational study uh, in two types based on whether we're looking at air pollution exposure contrast across time or across space. So if you're looking at the air pollution contrast across time, for example, uh, we can look at the daily levels of air pollution which varies day by day in, uh, in Miami, we can look at that daily variation in air pollution and correspondingly to look at daily variation in a certain house outcome like the daily mortality. So by doing that, we're essentially capitalizing the daily variations within one certain location. And for example, in Miami, you do expect the overall population level smoking diabetes rate changes over the days, right? So if you ask people um, about the air pollution uh, levels yesterday, tomorrow, most people won't know that very well. And as such, they might not adjust their behavior because of the air pollution levels. So in a way, the short-term air pollution study really provides a unique opportunity to study the health effects of air pollution varying at the short term of, um, 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 time scale, either from hourly to daily or, or weekly. So this type of design can be you know, uh, divided into broadly three types. One is what we call time series design. Another is called case crossover design. Uh, the third type is when you're starting a particularly extreme event, you, you can do some extreme event uh, analysis. And the beauty of this time short-term study is that because it's looking at short-term variations, so all these spatial or time environment confounding factors would be automatically controlled. But in the meantime, you would need to control other factors that can also have these data variations or other variations as your pollution exposure. Um, for example, we all often need to control the weather parameters like temperature and humidity. Um, but if we're looking at exposure contrast across space, across different cities, different locations, then we're essentially looking at relatively long term chronic exposure to this uh, pollution. So we're looking at really the long term chronic effects. And based on whether or not we have a demand. Uh, at the same time, which is a cross-sectional study, or you can follow the residents of locations um, longitudinally, you know, across multiple years or even decades. That is what we call cohort studies. And cohort studies uh, are one of the um, kind of most important study designs to understand the long-term health effect to air pollution. Um, and recently, um, there are also other uh, advances in epidemiology trying to use methods of causal inference of approaches that could mimic the experiment. Although we could not actually do an experiment exposing people to very high dangerous level of evolution for multiple years, 
we could capitalize some um, 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 extreme web episodes or some cause inference approaches to mimic such experiments, which is called the natural experimental designs. And this type of studies is the mostly focus on the contrast across space. So obviously we need to control a lot of the spatial confounding factors. Um, so the rest of the talk, I want to focus on using some of the examples from our uh, group uh, to mostly illustrate these two types of studies, focus on short-term or long-term. Uh, so for the short-term exposure, uh, one of the most used study designs time series, so here, uh, using 19, US, uh, 19 CT as an example, well, typically we can collect the air pollution measurements from airport quality stations and the short-term variations, uh, in this case, the daily uh, outpatient visits from hospitals in 19. And then we can uh, conduct these regression models to find out the association between the daily PM25 variations and the mental health outpatient visits in 19. And what we found is on the same day, uh, the PM25 exposure can significantly increase the risk for mental health outpatient visits. And that relationship, exposure, exposure to PM25 and the risk of uh, going to the, uh, the outpatient visits is almost a linear association. And we also did uh, analysis for other system diseases like respiratory illness, uh, circulatory uh, system disease, um, uh, endocrine disease, digestive, uh, urologic, and the dermatologic diseases, outpatient diseases as well. And we see the evidence that indeed PM25 can impact all these organ system diseases. And if you recall, uh, recently in 2021, um, the WHO, World Health Organization, have updated the global air quality guidelines. And for the short-term uh, air quality guidelines, they have strengthened the fine particular matter PM25 uh, standard to 15 microgram per cubic meter at the daily level. And then um, added uh, standards for nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. And the evidence behind this, uh, it's uh, a major contribution is from a group of work called Multi-Country, Multi-City Collaborative Research Network, the MCC work. And I have the pleasure to work with this MCC network to lead the carbon monoxide uh, um, exposure and, uh, uh, and response analysis to contribute to this WHO air quality guideline updates. But there are also other studies focused on PM25, PM10, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide. So given this talk is talked about PM25, so um, I'm, I'm holding the results for this um, PM, PM exposure and all cause mortality across more than 600 cities around the world. As you can see, uh, at that time in 2019, um, the, the, the WHO air quality guideline at 25 microgram uh, per cubic meter is not stressed enough, let alone all the other air quality guidelines in, 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 in China uh, or in other developed countries, they are not stressed enough because when you see the PM25 exposure below 25 microgram per cubic meter, you will still see this uh, steady increase in the risk of mortality. Another study uh, designed to uh, look at a short term exposure is what we call case crossover. And the case crossover design has a unique strength that um, many times we can do at an individual level analysis. That means we oftentimes can we're comparing the case to itself. And we're comparing the exposure on a case day to the exposures on the non-case states. So because it essentially comparing the exposure to the uh, patients itself, so a lot of these unmanaged individual level confounding factors uh, can be automatically adjusted for. So for here, this is an example we did in New York City, um, also focus on mental health uh, outcomes. Here we are looking at emergency room visits to the mental disorders. And we found that the daily variations in the PM25 can significantly lead to increased risk for mental disorders, emergency room visits. And if you dive deeper into the special cause of mental disorders, we see a significant increased risk for substances abuse, anxiety disorders, 
and psychotic uh, disorders as well. And we have another study that expanding from New York City to the entire New York State. Um, and when we look at uh, another system disease, the kidney disease, what we found is uh, using a really high resolution daily one kilometer by one kilometer uh, PM25 data set that we developed using a random uh, uh, using a random forest uh, approach, we found that the PM25 um, exposure can significantly increase the unplanned hospital visits for kidney conditions. Uh, for example, acute kidney failure, glu uh, glomeroma disease, and volume depression. All these unplanned uh, um, visits for hospitals could be significantly increased uh, after uh, a, a few days exposure to the PM25. And some of our uh, research goes beyond just the uh, um, PM mass pollution. Um, for example, in this study, we look at uh, the ultrafine particles that are smaller usually than the PM25. And um, because there's different matrix in defining the particle, uh, uh, ultrafine particles. So here we primarily focus on um, matrix that either using the particle number concentration, uh, whether it's below 100 nanometer or between 100 nanometer and 500 nanometer. Or uh, some studies have shown that uh, particle lens concentration or particle surface area concentration actually may be more relevant, biological relevant than just the particle number concentration. So here we compare these uh, uh, different matrix. And we are looking at the heart attack events using a heart attack register data in uh, uh, Augsburg city in Germany. So by using the same case course or design, what we find is even a few hours exposure here at six hours exposure to these ultrafine particles, we can see a significant increased risk uh, in triggering the uh, heart attack events. And if you look at the effect that by the different metrics, we see uh, no matter using the particle number concentration or lens or surface area concentration, we see a significantly increased risk. But fairly, uh, uh, in comparing the different metrics, we really see, first of all, even the relatively uh, cost uh, um, from 100 to 500 nanometer particle number concentration can also have an effect. But also, when we compare the number versus the lens and surface area concentration, we do see a slightly more robust uh, association when we're using the particle lens concentration or particle surface area concentration. In particular, when we consider the uh, controlling other pollutants, especially including PM25 or PM10 pollutions, we see the particle lens concentration, rem uh, the, these effects remain robust. So this may shed some light on in the future when we are uh, looking at ultrafine particle health effects. Uh, in, it may be uh, worth considering other potential metrics, including the lens and the surface area concentrations. The third type of design is event analysis. I think it's a good uh, example last year that uh, we have uh, in the East Coast experiencing this extreme uh, Wi-Fi smoke episode. So here, um, uh, I would just use this uh, smoke wave event in June 6 to 8 in New York City as an example. Um, what we uh, did in, in, right up, uh, after the uh, episode, we did quick analysis to see what's the air pollution level and what's the impacts on the house using the New York City's um, data. What we found is during this uh, smoke wave event, we really see a significant jump, about more than 10 times on PM25 level. Consequently, we see a 44% increase in the emergency department room visits in New York City. And in terms of the, all the other health factors, Wi-Fi smoke, I'm sure Anna will uh, talk later about the most um, state of the science uh, knowledge about the uh, health effects of Wi-Fi smokes. Um, talking about the long-term exposure, um, as I mentioned earlier, the cohort study is really the high count study design in helping us understand the adverse health impact of PM25. Um, with landmark study in the Hall of Six study in the um, you know, published in New England Journal of Medicine in the 1990s, um, 
this really is the first time illustrating that piano five can, can be associated with increased mortality. And over the past two decades, there has been uh, mounting evidence um, on cohort and, and linking piano five or different causes of uh, health outcomes. Uh, here I was illustrating this uh, using one recent uh, uh, example for using the Medicare enrollees uh, patient data. They found that almost a linear association between uh, annual exposure to PM5 and increased mortality risk among uh, the Medi uh, Medicare enrollees. But when we study the long term exposure, occasionally there may be some ex uh, uh, special events happening that could have. Let us leverage as a, a natural experiment. And one such example is COVID 19 pandemic. And it, as you recall, in the early 2020, when we have lockdowns that significantly improves air pollution, uh, improves air quality worldwide, not uh, starting from China, then in, in, in many uh, countries in, in India, in, in the US, in the Europe, we have seen due to the COVID 19 lockdown, there has been less pollution. So we did one of the very earliest analysis to try to quantify the health benefits from these air pollution reductions. Um, we did this study uh, focusing on the early 2020 uh, lockdowns throughout China, first beginning in Wuhan city, then quickly throughout the country. And we see a very clear evidence of the traffic really produced natural dioxide has been greatly reduced uh, during the lockdown versus previous lockdown. And also similarly, we see the evidence for PM25. So we did a quick analysis using a difference in difference uh, uh, approach to quantify the potential air pollution reduction during the lockdown. And consequently, we estimate about uh, thousands of deaths could have been avoided due to these air pollution reductions. Um, of course, uh, we have some uh, follow-up studies to expand the research scope and it, uh, using um, some more such, such, uh, comprehensive research methods, trying to uh, um, uh, in, uh, control more uh, marital or unmarried components using more advanced study designs. And talking about the difference, the indifference, it has been gaining um, quite a popularity in air pollution uh, epidemiology in recent years to quantify the long term uh, air pollution exposure. We did a, a study last year to look at the PM5 exposure and uh, the children's uh, academic performance um, in uh, the public health schools in North Carolina. And what we found is the PM5 exposure can really lower students' academic uh, scores for math and reading for uh, children at, uh, at grade three to grade eight in North Carolina. And they just want to really give you a heads up. Ask more evidence on the cognitive uh, performances of PM25 impacts. Um, and then across I just the want US, to give you a heads up that there's about four minutes left. Thank you, thanks. And based on that, we also um, did another study, tried to use a more advanced, what we call interactive fixed effect model uh, to look at the PM5 and the house um, disparity across the US. The background about this is we know over the past decades, air pollution has been greatly uh, reduced in, in the US. And we see the disproportionate burden across these uh, ethnic groups. But the question is, are these air pollution reductions have the same health benefits across racial and ethnic groups? To address that question, we first quantify the PN5 and adverse um, um, mortality burden by the racial and ethnic groups. And we found that not Hispanic and Black uh, people actually have three times higher attributable mortality rate compared to the white counterparts. And as a result, although we see a successful story in the PM25 reduction needs to overrule cardiovascular mortality burden, these reductions, but the relative disparity when we compare Hispanic versus uh, the, the non Hispanic Black versus white we see the relative disparity remains. So content impacts the house uh, through both direct temperature and also indirect air pollution. And we have illustrated how we do epidemiology to look at air pollution impacts. But 
in, indeed, air, country impacts air pollution not only through this indirect possible, a lot of these climate related factors can also interact with air pollution that impact our health. And one of these examples is temperature. So due to a lot of challenges, it's very uh, difficult to model the complex interaction between temperature and particular matter air pollution. We did an early study when we simply stratify temperature by three temperature range. And we see that when temperature are usually at high levels, the PM25 mortality risks are much higher. And recently, we've been updating the analysis, trying to come up with a unified framework with more flexible options to considering the different function forms for air pressure and temperature. And hopefully we can um, share this uh, work um, with the whole uh, field um, in a few months. So in summary, what we have seen is that the health effects of air pollution, especially particular, uh, fine particle matter, can impact multiple organ system diseases. And we see the evidence really from epidemiological study, either focused on short-term or long-term studies. And air pollution and climate change are closely linked. They are the two sides of the same coin, so which really calls for uh, the policies to have the synergistic pollution and climate control, which will bring immediate health co-benefits. And with that, I end today's talk. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kai, for a very robust discussion of uh, a number of studies, all of which point in the in the same direction of potential concern and uh, future research. So thank you very much. Okay, now we are moving on to the third presentation by uh, Dr. Bill Linksley, who is an engineer at uh, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And everyone uh, who uh, studies uh, virus aerosol uh, transmission knows Bill because uh, we all use uh, his uh, portable sampler <laughs> as oh, adopted worldwide. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Bill uh, Linksley for his talk. Okay, can you guys hear me and see the slides okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, well, I was going to talk about what uh, what we did at NIOSH, uh, specifically how aerosol science was used in the response to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So first, for those of you that don't know, um, I work for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, we're a U.S. government research institute, and we are part of the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. You know, as the name suggests, I mean, our focus mainly is to look at uh, preventing uh, work-related uh, illnesses and injuries. And in particular, my lab at Morgantown has been studying the aerosol transmission of respiratory viruses since about 2006, most of our focus being on healthcare facilities and healthcare workers. But during the COVID-19 pandemic, we were asked by CDC to start actually, to start doing work specifically looking at things like face masks and ventilation and that type of thing, ways to try to reduce um, the spread of SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so I mean, as we all know by now, SARS-CoV-2 is spread mainly by aerosols. And it's aerosols people make when they cough or sneeze or speak or even just breathe. And as you probably remember, early in the pandemic, there was a lot of debate over whether or not you should ask people to wear face masks. There was a lot of going back and forth on that. And the thing about face masks is really their primary benefit is what we call source control. That is the, the best thing that a face mask does is if somebody is infected and they're wearing a face mask, that mask helps to block those aerosols that person's generating from getting out into the environment. Okay, so this started in April of 2020. Um, the CDC had formed what they called a distance masking tiger team. And that team then asked our lab to very, very quickly uh, do some studies on how well face masks and other face coverings work to blocking these uh, respiratory aerosols. So to do that, this is the system we used. Uh, we call this the NIOSH Respiratory Aerosol Source Control Measurement System. At the top there, you'll see there's a computer-controlled bellows that's uh, driven by a linear motor. That bellows can reproduce uh, people's, the flow rates you see when people cough or breathe. And what we can do then is we can load that bellows up with an aerosol. And the test aerosol we used range from about 0.1 to 7 microns. That's roughly the range of aerosols that uh, people exhale that potentially could contain virus. Um, doing things like coughing or sneezing and speaking can also produce larger aerosols. 
But the thing about the smaller aerosols is, as you can imagine, as you all aerosol scientists, you can imagine smaller aerosols are more difficult to block than larger ones are. The smaller aerosols, of course, stay in the air longer, and they're also easier to inhale and they travel deeper into the lungs. So for all these reasons, we're really focused more on the smaller end of the uh, aerosol size range. So the idea is you've got that bellows, it's loaded with the aerosol, and then we can cough or exhale that through a head form. You know, that head form is covered with pliable skin, so it's similar uh, to a person. So we can do that um, without a mask and then do that with a mask. And comparing those two experiments, you can get a sense of just how much of that aerosol is being blocked by the mask. And so this is just uh, our system running. Uh, you can see there's a couple things I want you to note here. One is, of course, you're seeing a large aerosol cloud. But the other thing is that cloud travels a long way. You can see that's easily being carried, you know, six, seven, eight feet away from that person that's coughing. You know, so this is a big issue. It's not just the person's putting out infectious aerosols, but they can put them out over a pretty good distance. Now, on the other hand, this is what happens when you're wearing a mask. And this is a particularly well-fitting mask. I'll talk more about this in a minute. But the two things to notice are, one, there's a lot less aerosol. A lot of that aerosol is being blocked by that mask. And the second thing is that long jet you saw in the last video that's pretty much gone here. That aerosol is just, the velocities are much slower and it's being uh, dissipated much more quickly. Okay, so the first set of studies we did for CDC, we looked at cloth face masks, uh, neck gaiters, medical masks, and N95s. And again, our focus here really was on those as source control devices. So the question we were asking was, how much of that caulk or exhaled aerosol was being blocked by that mask? And we call that the collection efficiency. So what we found first off was an N95 respirator, as you might expect, blocked about 99% of the cough aerosol. N95s are extremely good source control devices. Unfortunately, as you'll recall, early in the pandemic, uh, there was a severe shortage of N95s. And so, you know, people in the general public and all were being asked not to use those, and instead were being asked to use things like cloth masks. So what we found then was things like medical masks and cloth masks and neck gaiters, they were all blocking about 50 to 60% of the cough aerosol. Um, that's good. It's not great, but you know you are having an impact. You are reducing the amount of infectious material that's getting out of the environment. Now, early in the pandemic, some people had suggested, no, you don't have to wear a face mask. You can just wear a face shield, and that'll serve the same purpose. And we had to, again, very quickly go through and do experiments and show, no, that was not the case at all, that face shields are not effective as source control devices, and you really need to wear a mask. And of course, again, what we did was as quickly as we could produce data, we would follow that up to CDC and CDC in turn would use that when they were setting guidance and recommendations and things like that. Okay, and as I said, you know, the cloth masks and medical masks, we were seeing about a 50 to 60% uh, blockage of source of these aerosols. That's good, but not great. And we said, well, what can we do to make that better? And it turns out that how well a mask blocks respiratory aerosols really depends on two things. Now, the first thing is just how good of a filter the mask is. That is, if the particles are going through that mask, you know, how good is the mask at blocking them? But the second thing is how well the mask fits the face. Because particularly with a lot of these non-woven medical masks, what you find is they're good filters, but they also have big gaps around the edges, particularly around at the sides of the cheeks and around the nose. And so a lot of those aerosol particles are not going through the mask, they're going around the mask. And that's how it is they're getting out of the environment. So we looked at three simple ways of trying to improve medical mask fit. And the first is what we call knotting and tucking. You see that in the photograph on the left there, you put a knot in the ear loop and then try to tuck the pleats of the mask in. On um, the second is on the upper right, that's called a mask fitter. That's an elastic strap that fits over the mask and helps to press it up against the face to reduce those face seal leaks. And the third is double masking, putting a cloth mask over the medical mask. And again, the reason this works is the cloth mask is more elastic and fits the face better. And so the cloth mask, again, was pressing that medical mask up against the face and again, trying to reduce those face seal leaks. Okay, so this is what we found. We looked at both coughing and breathing. And again, we found that the collection efficiencies for the cloth and medical mask were around 50 to 60%. But if you took that medical mask and you knotted it and tucked it, like I showed in the picture, you could increase that to 77%. So that's a pretty big increase for a pretty simple intervention. Uh, double masking, putting a cloth mask over the medical mask, got that up to 
And those mask fitters, those elastic straps that kind of went over the mask to help press the mask against the face, those worked very well. That uh, brought that collection efficiency up to 95%. So now you're blocking 95% of the aerosol that person's exhaling. You know, that's going to have a big impact in terms of disease transmission. You know, so clearly we were able to show that you know, it's not just a question of getting a good quality mask, but also that reducing those face seal leaks was a big factor in improving performance. Okay, so we were able to show that face masks were effective at blocking respiratory aerosols, but of course, as we all know, face masks were also very, very, very unpopular. And so once we'd gotten those initial studies done, the CDC said, okay, can you look at some other stuff as well? You know, what about things like increasing the room ventilation? What about using portable air cleaners in the room? What about increasing physical distancing? Can you give us data on those? So to do that, we actually took one of the conference rooms here in Morgantown, and we just translated it into a, into a lab to let us study the effect of different interventions. So this is what our conference room looks like now. It's got four of our uh, NIOSH respiratory aerosol simulators in there. So what we've got is one simulator that can cough or exhale aerosol particles into the room, and then we've got the other simulators that are in there breathing that are simulating uninfected people that are exposed to those things. So we can mimic, for example, a class where you've got one person in the class who's infected somewhere and you've got other people in the classroom and you can say, okay, now what are those people exposed to? So what we're doing is we use, uh, we use aerosol particle counters uh, to actually determine how much of that aerosol from the source works its way you know, to the speaker, to the other participants. And then of course, at that point, we can say, okay, now what happens if you increase the room ventilation? What happens if you put in portable air cleaners? What happens if everybody's wearing masks? You know, we can then compare the effect of these different interventions and see how good they really are. And again, this is just some of the data uh, that we presented. Uh, in this case, we looked, uh, you know, we started out by taking the room, setting up the experiments, and we put two portable HEPA air cleaners in the room that were giving us five air changes an hour. And we found that the two HEPA air cleaners reduced the exposure uh, to those aerosols by about 65%. So that's about a two-thirds reduction. Again, that's pretty good. You know, you are reducing the exposure to those infectious materials. We also found that if everybody in the room wore cloth masks, uh, you could reduce that aerosol exposure by 72%. So that's almost three quarters. But best of all, we found if you combine those two things, if you did universal masking and also use the HEPA air cleaners, you could reduce the exposure by 90%. So now you're really starting to have a big impact. And so one of the things we were able to show with this and some other experiments is that these different interventions were good, but it was really best to do a layered approach. You'd like to increase ventilation and increase filtration and you know, do masking because all these things work together um, to give you a much bigger reduction than you would see um, if you were just trying to use them one by one. Now, of course, you know, we were in a pandemic, right? I mean, the goal of this whole thing was not just to do these experiments, but to get the information out where people could actually use it. And so the first thing we were doing was we were funneling our information as quickly as we could to the CDC. And the CDC in turn would use this when they were developing guidelines and making recommendations and putting up their web pages and that type of thing. But also to kind of get this stuff out more broadly during the pandemic, we were able to publish 10 journal articles uh, on the different uh, research that we were doing. We did a variety of presentations. We did a dozen different presentations to various organizations. Uh, we ended up doing 22 news media interviews over the course of the pandemic. And one way of measuring the impact of what we were doing is there's a service called Altmetric. And Altmetric just uh, monitors how often a scientific report or a scientific journal article is mentioned online. So it's mentioned in a blog or Twitter or the news or something like that. And what we found was for the work that we had done, kind of the pandemic related work we did before and during the pandemic, um, we had almost 2000 mentions in the news media. We had um, 38,000 mentions on Twitter. And we've been cited on eight Wikipedia pages, and we've also been cited 141 times in policy documents. You know, so clearly we do think we were having an impact. I mean, we feel like the information was getting out there where people could actually use it. Yo, uh, we do have to wrap up very soon. Oh, good. That's fine. Last slide. Um, I just want to acknowledge a lot of people made um, did a lot of work on this thing. I want to acknowledge all their contributions, and at that point, I'm done. Thank you so much. Amazingly, we are on time actually a little bit earlier. One quick question, if anyone from the uh, audience. If not, right now we'll move on to the next presentation. We have all the questions at the uh, panel discussions.
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Actually, I, I should uh, say that um, I think, and perhaps we'll come out in the discussion at the Wall Street Journal this morning, said there's no rhyme or reason uh, for the six-foot rule for the masking. So I'll be interested to hear what the uh, <laughs> what the response will be. Uh, the next speaker will be uh, <clears throat> Anna Rapold from uh, the EPA. Uh, she went to Duke and received her PhD in statistics and data science um, in uh, 2004. Uh, in 2019, uh, she received the Arthur uh, Fleming Award for real-time communication and data collection about smoke and um, and health outcomes uh, regarding uh, wildfire events. So I look forward to uh, hearing uh, her thoughts this morning. Thank you very much. Anna? Well, thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's actually very interesting. Um, my In my current position, I am um, a branch chief for clinical research here at DPA. And we actually do a lot uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we did a lot of research. My colleagues did a lot of research on um, filtering efficient, uh, efficiencies of masks. Um, this were um, mainly led by uh, Dr. Jim Semet and Steve Prince. So uh, maybe at some future date, we could have uh, the conversation between uh, both sides, the, um, the capture of particles and the filtering efficiency. <clears throat> so, um, of course, I have to um, show the disclaimer that uh, nothing I uh, say may be construed for um, official policy or opinions. Um, everyone in this audience is probably uh, knows that wildfire smoke and air pollution is a complex mi mixture that includes numerous pollutants such as particulate matter, carbon monoxide, and organic um, chemicals, among others. And most of these constituency, uh, constituents of uh, air pollution are actually known um, health risks. In fact, because of the weight of evidence and public health benefit um, produced by uh, controlling the air pollution, some of these constituents are actually regulated under the provisions of the Clean Air Act. These include um, particulate matter, ozone, uh, carbon monoxide, and then um, there are other constituents, uh, uh, there are other um, air pollutants such as lead, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur um, dioxide, which are not um, commonly associated with wildfire smoke, but um, certainly can be. Now, because there is multitude of constituencies, you know, constituents in the smoke, um, and they all have uh, health effects. Um, they are, or they don't all, I just said, most of them have health effects. Water vapor does not have um, um, uh, health effects. It complicates the assessment of the, um, you know, of, of health effects uh, in epidemiological research. And not all of them are uh, measured um, regularly in time or in space that we could use in large epidemiologic uh, research. As a result, studies examine wildfire smoke uh, either use the indicator of exposure that broadly represents smoke, or they focus on particulate matter. Particulate matter is certainly a, the most widespread pollutant um, during wildfire smoke, and it has a very strong um, evidence of a causal uh, relationship with number of health outcomes. These are I almost never talk about um, the size of the particles. So it's very interesting that I am, my um, presentation is following several presentations that uh, mentioned on the particle size, um, but these small particles uh, can penetrate deep into the lung, lungs where the increased inflammation, oxidative stress and um, coagulation that leads to uh, systematic um, problems and outcomes that are that may need um, serious attention such as you know um, stroke or um, uh, heart attack 
So as I said, I almost never talk about uh, particle size, but it actually, or the composition, but it's actually very important in terms of um, understanding health effects. So when we think about health effects of particulate matter, we first seek to understand the particle size and the dose, specifically the intake, how much is inhaled, the deposition, um, retention, how long the particle stays, and the translocation of particles. Where do they go in the body once they are um, inhaled? The amount, the amount of particles that we breathe is um, into the bo body and ultimately where they're deposited and retained depends on the number of factors, which include um, particle concentration and exposure duration, physical activity. We breathe in a um, lot. We um, breathe at a faster rate when we're exerting ourselves um, and breathing conditions, whether we're inhaling through nose or through mouth, as well as particle properties. And uh, you can see in this figure that the smaller the part, these two figures kind of um, illustrate that smaller the particles are, the more likely they're re they are to reach the lower regions of the respiratory tract. The larger particles um, are easier to trap in the nasal passage, um, but the smaller they are, the deeper they go into the um, lungs where um, in, into all the way to alveoli and the bloodstream where it can affect uh, um, organ system, including cardiovascular system. Now, Clean Air Act specifically talks about protecting sensitive populations. And the decades of research on health effects of the ambient PIM 2.5 exposures indicate that there is no uh, concentration that at which no health effects occur. And that some people may be at higher risk of health outcomes um, due to either inherent factors or like um, internal factors such that predispose them to experience um, health effects such as those, such as like existence of chronic conditions um, or the age, uh, older adults are at higher risk, um, you know, because many physiological processes uh, slow down uh, with age, but they also, there's higher incidence of chronic uh, diseases, which then um, increase the risk of having a health outcome. And children are typically at a higher risk, considered at a higher risk because they breathe in a um, lot more air per, per volume of body or um, lungs then, and you know, they're, they're more active. And um, I don't know how true this is um, over time, but can, they, in literature, they've always been considered that they are, um, they spend more time outdoors. Um, where was I? Um, <clears throat> uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that uh, one can be at higher risk because they're more likely to um, be experiencing higher exposures, which include lower socioeconomic status or, or outdoor workers. And this is particularly true during wildfire smoke episodes when, um, you know, uh, people have to make immediate um, action. So uh, they have to respond to changing uh, conditions and they may not be able to, you know, financially or uh, for numerous other reasons be um, able to respond by ensuring the, um, their home is, you know, well, well isolated and that it has clean filtration, uh, filtration of clean, effective filtration of clean air and so forth. Um, and um, also the last thing to remember is that um, there is a lot of unpredictable exposures um, during wildfire smoke and that's um, many people, you know, that everyone at very high concentrations, even healthy people will be affected, but those um, health outcomes are uh, generally considered reversible. Now, for those who are ambitious to study further, 
um, health effects or how their work um, links to the health effects, I would recommend uh, reading sections of the integrated science assessment um, that is conducted by EPA every five or so years. It's, um, it's an extensive review in which the evidence uh, published in literature uh, is evaluated um, and in order to inform the policy um, decisions, right? Um, so that the, the consideration of policy um, changes can be evaluated based on scientific evidence, but it's two separate processes. Um, it also, because it's such an extensive process, it um, it's a very good and objective um, review of literature for those who don't want to like you know study health effects, um, but just want to know the broad um, uh, the broad things. Now, in terms of uh, fun, this integrated science assessment uses the Hill model and the weight of evidence approach that integrates evidence across multiple disciplines to provide causal determination for different exposures. And the strongest, um, the strongest evidence of causal association in literature uh, has been with respect to cardiovascular effects, both for short-term and long-term exposure and for mortality. Now, because there are known health effects of air pollution and known uh, benefits of um, reduction of air pollution, um, over the over the states, in order to comply with the regulation, their regulations, and in order to comply with the regulations, states um, take on a lot of uh, measures to reduce um, air pollution. Technological changes also contributed to the reduction of air pollution. So as a result, a number of pollutants, um, their concentrations in ambient air have been decreasing. Fine particulate matter here, I don't know how well you can see, but it's in purple. Can you see if I move my mouse? Yes, we see purple. All right, um, has been reducing over time. But now in the recent years, um, this graph ends here, 2018, but then in recent years, uh, as we all know, uh, exposure to wildfire smoke is like reaching um, new heights year after year. This, um, this, this is a nice uh, uh, paper by McClure and Jaffe in PINAS in 2018 that actually showed um, that the trends are not uh, homogeneous across the whole country, right? And in fact, in some parts of the country, air pollution has been increasing and most of that increase um, has been attributed to the occurrence of uh, wildfire smoke. So note, but even, but having said that, it is uh, also important, like, the trends are different geographically, but the small the smoke is not a local issue. And these are a couple of graphics from Air Now Fire and Smoke a map, uh, where you can see that fires in um, the western part of the country move the plumes all the way to the east coast, and fires from Canada here on the right um, in increase the air pollution across the whole eastern. Um, United States. All right, now I'm going to go into a little bit of um, health effects of um, wildfire smoke specifically. But my research actually um, have begun not with Western fires, but with the fire that occurred in North Carolina in peatlands. And if you've lived in Florida or in the Southeast, you have probably uh, experienced the smell of peat fires. Um, they're not very common, uh, but when they occur, they pose um, quite a bit of a health concern. This last summer, uh, there were peat fires in southern Louisiana. If you have, um, if you had uh, experienced them, it's quite an unpleasant um, situation. But in North Carolina, we have we 
we have a surveillance program that collects data from emergency departments in every um, emergency department uh, across the state. So we have a nearly a complete capture. And what we noticed in this like few days, most of the time smoke was, you know, going over the over toward the ocean, as you can see here, over um, uh, the islands and the ocean. But in the three days when the winds changed the direction, the smoke exposed very populated area for several days. And during this time, we observed you know, up to 60% increase over um, in emergency department cumulatively over uh, three days. And um, what was noted at the time was the first time that uh, cardiovascular effects have been observed with wildfire smoke. And this wasn't a surprise to us because previously we always studied air pollution from urban, um, from anthropogenic sources and cardiovascular effects are um, well, uh, well understood. But in the wildfire smoke literature, which at the time, this is back 10, 15 years ago, um, cardiovascular effects have not been uh, documented. So that was our first line of like following up on the um, on the outcomes. And in the next- study, I have to, uh, I apologize for interrupting you, but you have about uh, two minutes left. So thank really? you. Yes, sorry. I, I thought I had 30 minutes, I'm sorry. Um, so, well, um, how should I go? Um, I'm going to skip over, but you can have the slides um, over, you know, cardiovascular and respiratory health effects of wildfire smoke. Um, the, the remaining task is now how do we reduce health uh, burden? And this is a very complex social issue that has to be addressed on multiple levels. Um, the way EPA has approached this is also multi-pronged approach. Uh, one is focusing on exposure reduction and public health messaging, providing re reliable information on how to, um, to stakeholders, on how to access the resources that allow the public to take actions and reduce exposures, um, ensuring that activities and recommendations at multiple levels of our, of our society are cohesive, right? And that health risk communication messages are clear and consistent. Uh, we do a lot of education and um, outreach, education type of outreach. Uh, and then we do a lot of science related to promoting behavioral change and from um, increasing the salience of taking behavioral action. So understanding better by if you take a certain action, how much um, um, how much reduction in air pollution will you be experienced? That kind of specific information can provide people with more certainty over when they're facing the decision whether or not they should take a specific action. So um, in the, there's, EPA has put a lot of resources. This is uh, some of the resources that are, um, that can be found at the Smoke Ready Toolbox, which is like information clear, clearing house if um, you're ever looking for some. And I just wanna, before I finish, I just wanna go into like the gaps that exist currently in the literature. And one of the emerging um, gaps is long-term, what are the consequences of long-term uh, exposure to wildfire smoke? Um, this has not ever been an issue before, in, um, but in, in with the occurrence of wildfire smoke across the continent and uh, in Canada and Mexico coming uh, into the United States, the long-term exposures are becoming an issue. Um, along with that is also the, the effects of exposure at very short scales. So um, what are the outdoor how to protect the outdoor workers is one hour, two hours of exposure. What are the um, limits of safety? And then understanding the effectiveness of the public health messaging. Uh, it's a very challenging problem because we provide a lot of information, but how well the public is actually um, um, integrating those into their uh, behaviors. And 
And what are the uh, changes in health risk with the changing of the wildfire smoke mixture? As wildfire smoke, as wildfires get closer to wildland urban interfaces and man-made structures burn, the toxicity of these uh, mixtures changes quite a bit. So um, how do we deal with that and public, uh, public warning systems? Um, and uh, in my final words, I just want to say that this public, public health um, messaging and the availability of actions and interventions can be instituted um, to reduce wildfire smoke exposure. And it's part of, it's part of um, uh, the work that multiple agencies um, um, have undertaken. Um, right now, the current operational um, um, understanding is that, that there are health effects of PM 2.5 at all levels and, all, and a, lot of con a lot of health effects are consistent with what we know from other studies of uh, air pollution, like urban air pollution studies. After all, up to 50% of the urban air pollution actually um, is from biomass burning. So um, certainly a lot of what we know from urban air pollution studies translate in the context of wildfire smoke, even though there's a lot of gaps still, particularly to wildfire smoke. So there's enough evidence that, you know, pub public health has to be taken seriously and, um, and we have to be proactive about communicating those um, health effects. So I'm sorry about that. I uh, misunderstood um, the timelines. Um, but I can certainly share um, all the slides and references and participate in. Anna, discussion. thank you. Uh, yeah, where uh, I apologize, I apologize as well. Uh, but thank you very much for your uh, presentation, and I'm sure it will come up for more discussion in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, the next uh, is the final presentation of uh, this section. It's going to be given by uh, Dr. Ed Coker. Uh, Dr. Coker is a senior scientist at the British Columbia CDC and uh, Environmental Health Services. And also uh, he's a, a professor at UBC School of Population and Public Health. His ex expertise is in exposure science and epidemiology. He has done work related to uh, fire smoke, uh, health effects, and uh, also uh, the uh, COVID. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Coker. Thank you very much, CY. I, I really appreciate the invitation and to speak after all these really uh, interesting talks. Um, I, I've learned a lot about myself. Um, uh, today, I want to talk about, uh, I want to clear there a little bit, talk about some key, key insights into leveraging low-cost air quality sensors and machine learning to um, to really understand indoor PM 2.5 exposure from wildfire smoke and some of the active ongoing research I have going on here at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. Oops, my slides are not progressing. So uh, I, I really appreciate that uh, Anna Rapold spoke before me, so I don't have to spend too much time talking about wildfire smoke in particular. Um, uh, but uh, I will be talking about wildfire smoke exposure quite a bit, um, but I don't have to give too much background there as well as on PM 2.5. But I want to start with this slide. This is um, results from a study from the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis uh, conducted in the U.S., where um, they were interested in how well does outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, and personal modeling of uh, PM 2.5 in particular how well does that reflect measurements of people's PM 2.5 exposure? And what they found, so this uh, bar, the bar, the box plot on the, on the top here is showing you measured personal PM 2.5. And what they found was that when they model personal, I'm sorry, when they model indoor PM 2.5 and measure indoor PM 2.5, those are the those are the estimates that are much, much more similar to people's individual exposures 
Um, uh, and uh, and this is true for, uh, and they looked at particularly for PM 2.5 of ambient or origin. And so what this means is that when people are exposed to outdoor air pollution, uh, you know, more than half of it is coming, uh, is occurring when people are indoors because people spend so much time indoors. Infiltration of outdoor air pollution occurs, uh, it happens and it, PM 2.5 of the ambient origin ends up in the indoor environment, as well as indoor sources of PM 2.5. And uh, Anna just did a great job of kind of summarizing, you know, there's public health messaging around what do we do when it gets really smoky? Well, the current public health guidance, which is appropriate, is to stay indoors, seal seal off your home. So close windows, close doors, um, clean, you know, use air filtration to try to clean the indoor air. So what that means as smoky conditions uh you know, as air pollution worsens outside from wildfire smoke, uh, probably what's going to happen is, you know, what's happening outdoors has become re less reflective of what's happening indoors. And uh, a low cost sensor study where we have a lot of sensors uh, located indoors and outdoors in British Columbia does find that as PM 2.5 becomes more extreme outdoors, uh, the, the indoor outdoor ratio, meaning uh, the ratio of indoor PM versus outdoor PM uh, decreases substantially, as you see in these box plots here. Uh, work, other, other research done uh, using low cost sensors where they spatially uh, co uh, identify indoor purple air sensors and outdoor air, purple air sensors, they find you know, infiltration does tend to decrease as conditions become more smoky or as uh, PM 2.5 becomes more extreme. So what this suggests is people may be staying indoors more and, uh, you know, trying to reduce filtration of uh, PM 2.5 and trying to clean their air actively. Other research done using low cost sensors suggests that, uh, so this graph uh, on, the, on the left here is showing the effect of um, a 50 microgram per meter cubed increase of PM 2.5 on people searching for air filtration on using Google, that sort of thing. And what they find is that um, people in higher income communities tend to actively search for how do I clean my air in my home? Um, so what this suggests is there's, there's a socioeconomic gradient in terms of who's trying to take active um, uh, measures to reduce PM 2.5 or wildfire smoke uh, exposure. Um, the study also found that um, folks that are staying home typically are those who live in higher income communities. So people stay. So uh, again, what this suggests is there's a socioeconomic component to people staying indoors and uh, you know uh, using air, fil air filtration and other types of uh, uh, preventive measures. So now I'm going to uh, talk about a specific study that I've got going on in British Columbia. It's funded by Health Canada. Phase one of the project involved co-locating indoor and outdoor low-cost sensors, in particular air quality eggs, at uh, daycares and uh, long-term care facilities throughout BC. And the purpose here was to estimate the relationship between daily outdoor PM uh, as a proxy, or what's the relationship between outdoor PM 2.5 and indoor PM 2.5 as a basically a proxy of infiltration. And we wanted to compare this relationship between days impacted by wildfires and days that were not impacted by wildfires. And what we did confirm um, kind of controlling for a lot of confounders um, is that on wildfire days, there was a slight decrease in the um, in the infiltration of PM 2.5. Uh, so it's really, people are, you know, apparently the data suggests that there is this lower infiltration during, you know, wildfire events. And now we've moved on to aim two of this. So we got a second round of funding from Health Canada. And now we're basically, we've developed an indoor PM 2.5 exposure model for British Columbia using machine learning and combining uh, machine learning capabilities with our deployed indoor outdoor sensors and using publicly available data. Um, there's some other aims that I won't get into, but I'm really going to focus on the development of this indoor exposure model and how we evaluated it. Um, this map is showing you throughout British Columbia over the last 13 years. Uh, where, where are the hotspots for uh, biomass or wildfire smoke events? Um, you can see there's a lot of wide variability throughout the province of British Columbia in Canada. And, uh, but just to, I want, I'm showing this map just to point out that a lot of the sensors, uh, we have about 50 sites that are 
co-located with indoor outdoor sensors. Um, they represent these high impacted areas, moderate impacted areas as low impacted areas. So we have this nice representation and contrast throughout the province uh, in terms of wildfire smoke impacts. This is our study area. All the um, local health authorities highlighted in green, those are local health authorities where we have um, our co-located sensors at. And all of the other located, uh, local health authorities um, indicated here is where we have uh, predicted indoor PM 2.5 with our uh, modeling. And so the, the again, what we did here is we developed a model for indoor PM 2.5, as well as a separate model for outdoor PM 2.5. And we use the same exact approach for in developing these models. But I'll, so we, you know, we the, the data ran from July 2022 to September 2023, including that uh, extreme wildfire season in, in Canada. Um, and we split our data with uh, based on a training and test data set. And then we have our out of sample validation set, which was the ex very ex DC's most extreme wildfire season ever on recorded record. Um, so so we, we tested the validity of our model uh, in, for indoor and outdoors uh, on that out of sample uh, set. Uh, our the the variables we used to build our machine learning model uh, included ambient uh, spatio temporal predictors, which is uh, our uh, low cost air quality egg sensors, purple air sensors, and federal equivalents uh, regulatory monitors throughout the province, where we got the outdoor PM two point five levels from all those monitors, as well as meteorological data from those monitors. We also use those data as uh, it, uh, as inputs for deriving smooth surfaces of in, using inverse distance weighting, and those were additional uh, outdoor PM two point five and outdoor meteorological predictors as well. And then we also use spatial socioeconomic predictors, the uh, in particular the Canadian index of multiple deprivation, and you can see the different um, uh, indicators that are used uh, to compile that. So we use all four domains. Uh, and as additional predictors as a proxy for uh, factors that influence uh, infiltration of PM 2.5. Um, so just to uh, summarize here, one of our ways of evaluating the, mo the, the, the output of the models was to um, just derive the indoor PM 2.5 at the outdoor PM 2.5 using machine learning, but also other metrics um, using uh, inverse distance weighting, observed FEM data, and observed purple air data. And we sit, fit separate epidemiological time series uh, ecological models looking at respiratory outcomes uh, using a negative binomial, binomial multivariable regression model. And we compare the effect estimates between these different exposure assessment approaches with the idea that the, the, the closer we get to people's real world exposures uh, or population exposures in this case, um, uh, we would uh, we would be less biased towards the null in an epidemiological context. Um, and so the, I'll jump into the results and these are unpublished. So take that with a grain of salt. But this is the time series of our four air monitoring uh, sources, including the indoor uh, data. But you can see a clear um, seasonal trend as we have a strong wildfire season trend for PM 2.5. All of the monitors are telling a similar story, um, but note that the uh, indoor egg uh, low-cost sensor consistently shows lower uh, levels compared to the outdoor measurements. Um, and just to point out that uh, while I have a, a priori defined wildfire seasons, there's some evidence that there was wildfire activity outside of those time windows. Uh, and this graph is just showing you how extreme the 2023 wildfire season really was uh, in British Columbia. All of the distributions, no matter what measurement you're looking at, um, are all showing more uh, indications of smoky events, as well as exceedances of the BC air quality standards. Um, and uh, however, for the indoor measurements, you can see these exceedances um, are, are, are less pronounced during the 2023 wildfire season, which comes into play. Um, we do confirm that as smoky events become more extreme, the indoor outdoor ratio drops dramatically. Um, again, reinforcing the idea that as smoky conditions get more extreme, the indoor environment is less similar to what's happening outdoors and people are spending more time indoors and shutting off their uh, kind of exposure to outdoor sources of PM. 
Uh, and then this is the model performance. Again, we built an indoor machine learning model, an outdoor machine learning model. And uh, the, the test set on the, on the left uh, for the indoor and the outdoor, uh, both performed quite well. The outdoor performed a little bit better, but I want to note that the validation set where we held out the extreme uh, uh, wildfire season of 2023, the indoor model actually performs much better. And I want to highlight the root mean squared error is about cut in half when we look at the indoor predictions. And what's going on here, um, uh, when we look at the, the when we, we do a scatter plot, they look very similar, the indoor and outdoor performance predictions. Um, but when we look at it on an absolute difference, um, so predicted minus observed, we can see for the, uh, the on the, the lower right-hand quadrant, um, the outdoor model uh, is less able to predict well these very extreme events, whereas the indoor model um, deals with these extreme events much better uh, because of the absolute um, levels that are getting indoors are lower. So we have this kind of, we're getting closer to people's real world exposures or population level at least. This map is really interesting. It shows the percent difference between um, our predicted exposures at the LHA level um, for indoors and outdoors. And so if you see an area that is red, that suggests that indoors during the wildfire season was higher compared to outdoors and then vice versa for blue. Um, and also the uh, the socioeconomic predictors were, were more important in the indoor model, much more so than the outdoor model. It's telling us that these socioeconomic indicators are what's driving these uh, better accuracy. And uh, I, I guess I'll just, uh, probably running out of time here, but just to show you here that um, when we look at the effect estimates for asthma and, and inhaler dispensations, uh, the indoor model uh, uh, it results in about a doubling of the effect estimate compared to all of our outdoor um, uh, exposure metrics. And this is the same story when you look at um, wildfire seasons uh, when I run stratified results. And so I'll conclude here. Um, uh, so our key findings, the record-breaking wildfire activity in 2023 contributed significantly to more smoky days compared to 2022. Um, although these relative uh, smoke impacts were lessened in the indoor environment, which is a, an important part of the story. Indoor PM 2.5 predictions performed better than outdoor predictions for the extreme 2023 season. Uh, predicted indoor PM resulted in a doubling of the adjust adjusted effect size compared to the outdoor metrics. And indoor-outdoor ratios decreased during wildfire season and extreme smoky events. And deprivation indices were more important for the indoor model than the outdoor model which is likely explained by multiple factors related to behaviors and building characteristics. So in conclusion, by combining uh, you know, available monitoring, air monitoring and social deprivation data with co-location of low cost sensors, coupled with machine learning techniques, this approach has strong potential to significantly improve wildfire smoke exposure assessment and improve our exposure characterization of PM 2.5 and, and lead to better health effects estimates. We just need more work done in this space to kind of see, look at the generalizability of this work. So thank you for your time. And uh, I also just want to thank uh, folks, William uh, uh, William Ho, Namin Paul, Stephanie Cleland, and Sarah Henderson in particular for uh, some of the work, uh, kind of guidance in some of this work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And uh, uh, now we are going to take a three minutes biological break. Uh, so <laughs> get some food or drink or go to the bathroom and uh, we will be back for the panel discussion in three minutes. Thank you. Arrangement of chairs. Yes. Yes. Oh. Are we, no, because it's remote. No, remote, all remote. All, all of them are remote. Uh, all yes. remote, so no okay. chairs for this. Okay. Yeah. Can you remind everyone that in the afternoon it will be in person speakers in case okay. they feel like it's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, good, yeah. good point. Okay.
Get started. Huh? Let's get started. Let's get started. Yeah. I'll let you go first. Okay. All right, everyone. So let's get back to, to the panel discussion. And uh, uh, maybe we'll start from uh, a question from the Zoom. So this is question from uh, uh, for Bill Lindsley. And has the particle collection efficiency for face mass being investigated during inhalation as well? I would imagine that low velocity inhalation through the nose is somewhat different to a cough in terms of aerosol flow through uh, or around a mask. Yeah, uh, if you think about it, you know, things like N95 respirators, those are really sold to protect people from, you know, particles in the air, like in industrial settings and healthcare and that. So there's actually, there's a much larger body of literature looking at inhalation protection as versus looking at source control. And there's also in, in the United States, most other countries, there's a large regulatory framework that actually, you know, controls those things. So yeah, there's quite a bit of work to be done in that area. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now uh, the uh, floor is open to open open to the audience over here in the Zoom for any question. Maybe I'll start with one that I have in my mind for a long time. So uh, during the uh, you know the uh, COVID time. We always advise people to have a better ventilation, open a window, right? And then uh, the wildfire smoke comes and say, oh, you should not be exposed to outdoor. 
so from the policy perspective, uh, um, when you have these two together, um, how do you really advise the public for what to do during that moment? I think this is a question for uh, all the panels. I mean, I can chime in just, uh, I think uh, one th uh, others can chime in as well. But uh, one thing I would recommend is that folks monitor as much as they can air quality. If if smoke hasn't rolled in yet, um, or it's it's dissipated, it's diluted, um, you know, it, you know, the emphasis should be on increased ventilation if, if air quality is safe. Um, that that's one thing that people can do. Um, obviously, it becomes more complex when the smoke is there and, and uh, you're still concerned about aerosols from uh, viral aerosol exposure. Yes, Bill, I'll, I'll chime in just very quickly. Yeah, that's a tough question, unfortunately, because you're right, that is a problem. I mean, again, one thing, another thing you can do is you can wear a respirator, like an N95 respirator will protect you from both, but you know, that, that gets uncomfortable after a while. So yeah, I don't have a real good answer for that. Well, what it does, I think uh, from all the public house uh, evidence is showing that, you know, when you have this Wi-Fi smoke, people shouldn't just treat it as, oh, this sky turns orange, let's take a picture and then move on, right? So if, if you know, for example, the storms are preventing us from going to Miami. When these extreme weather events happening, when you know there's a flood of warnings, hurricanes coming, you adjust their schedule, right? So if you, you need to go to work outside for some time, maybe wearing a mask during that out of working time can really protect you. So I think that's the first message we want to convey is that these Wi-Fi smoke is really also a, a house emergency. So we should treat it as life touch. I mean, uh, another thing that is, is easy to let get to lose sight of the in the discussion is air filtration. Um, if 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 ventilate if you're trying to make the the decision between ventilation versus uh, like if, if, you know, if you do have a small space that it's reasonable, even a DIY, you know, box fan filter can uh, reduce particle uh, abundance. And uh, so if, if, if you can filter the air, that is, is another option that does deal with both, right? The wildfire smoke and uh, maybe not increasing ventilation per se, but um, certainly, you know, reducing the, the aerosols. So I'm I'm uh, listed as a discussant, so I'm going to discuss. Why not? Um, so first of all, for <clears throat> clarity, I I am uh, from a school of public health, uh, so my comments will be public health oriented. Um, but I am going to try to tie together yesterday to today. So yesterday, what I saw yeah. were well controlled experiments that led to very clear, elegant. Uh, unambiguous results. Today, what I've seen appropriately uh, is the use of obs observational data many times that is population-based, which is much more messy. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the issues about weight of evidence, about confounding, in other words, what other factors might there be that are causing excess risk, let's say, in cardiovascular disease, it's not only the, the PM 2.5, there's gonna be other things as well. And so I have two general questions for the panelists to begin. Uh, one would be how, uh, it, it seemed like your results also were quite consistent and very homogeneous and, and life was beautiful and, and uh, you know not much was going on, but I'm sure that there are subpopulations in which there must be some different effects than what, we were presented. So how how have you gone about looking at interactions and and robustness of results uh, in the studies that you uh, discussed uh, this morning for us? So that's the first question to the, all the panelists. So maybe I can 
just uh, case studies. So uh, in a lot of these uh, observational epidemiological study designs, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, the essential challenge in the epidemiology is what we so-called the unmarried confounding factors, that there are some factors that may affect your exposure, PM25 and Wi-Fi, but also affect your health. But there's no way in reality, either there's no direct measurement or it's not a, feasible to gather that amount, for example. Ideally, we would like to have this personal exposure for everyone during the Wi-Fi smoke, but that's just not feasible. So how do we, can, you know, either through design control it or through other sources that we can do it. So there's a uh, different study designs have these merits and limitations and assumptions. So uh, that's why I presented, you know, the different ways of, of controlling this American founding factor, and it's also very critical in a lot of our research to conduct what we call sensitivity analysis. That means the one way, it, you know, you, you can additionally control the factor you can control or using multiple different designs. The, the, the fact that we see folks using Wi-Fi as an example, we see multiple evidence on the respiratory illnesses from different types of designs. And then that is a, a whole body of evidence trying to uh, uh, support the essentially the cause of this. But as I think some of the um, panels uh, present, the random control trials of the golden standard, but in reality, we couldn't do that. So uh, that's why the recent analysis in causal inference trying to mimic that kind of random assigned exposure. So we can randomly assign exposure to the same study population in study design. That may be one, one way to move forward. Thanks. You know, Anna is next, followed by Eric. Anna? Yeah, this um, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to uh, just follow to what um, uh, started with the causal inference um, paradigm. We also use extensively um, the, the use of like negative controls, um, mm. negative control outcomes and negative control uh, exposures. It's not always... Um, easy uh, for example in the in in a study one of the the, the california study of uh, emergency department visits um, we used uh, several outcomes like appendicitis um, is, is not known to be associated with wildfire smoke um, we um, and several other things but one of the things that we had used was uh, long bone um, breakage um, as a negative control. That in several studies showed up as actually being associated with wildfire smoke. Now, it's hard to explain that in a, in a paper very briefly, but it's one of the emerging things. What, what happens is um, there's a lot of car accidents associated with wildfire smoke. There's, you know, there's evacuations. There's a lot of cars on the road. There's also um, uh, super fog events that lead to even, you know, you don't have that many long bones uh, breakages per day in a, in a remote areas. So when you have, a, you know, several people break their bones uh, in a car accident, that's gonna show up. So there's like indirect effects of, um, um, of, of the exposure. But the one the, the one um, example I did show was in that Pocosan fire. You actually like almost don't need to have any analysis. Um, you can see in the graph, I don't know if you noticed on the left-hand side, um, asthma counts per day. And it just like on the day when the smoke comes in, it goes up and it goes down. Now, if we compare that to the surrounding area where population is very similar this is rural North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina. Population is very similar, but the smoke doesn't reach those areas. In, in, in their time series, the daily events of asthmas uh, stay very constant. So that's just from epidemiologic, but there's another, there's clinical studies, there's toxicological studies that all um, help. There's also multiple uh, use of multiple exposure metrics that we have come a long way now 
in having multiple exposure metrics, right? Um, not just uh, smoke plumes um, or uh, CMAC or other or high split, but now we can um, have um, machine learning. You apply machine learning approaches and incorporate a lot of different sources to get better exposure estimates. So we can estimate out um, associations with multiple exposure metrics. Let me just make a, a comment, and then we'll go on to Eric. So my comment is, as I always think of uh, my students, uh, is uh, the importance in designing an experiment in which you select the, the right control group. It is a non-trivial task uh, to do that. And again, I'm trying to point out the distinction between, let's say, yesterday's talks, which were very well-controlled experiments, and the nature of observational studies, that's one messy component of, of, gee, what are we going to select as a control to convince us that there really is something of a causal nature uh, going on? So, uh, Eric, next, please. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I mean, I, I can only talk about it in the way I've handled this, uh, you know, interaction or effect modification issues. Um, in the context of the epi studies that I've done, uh, both time series, ecological time series uh, analyses and um, population cohort studies, um, you know, I, I've, you know, approached it a couple of ways, you know, kind of looking at, um, you know, population subgroups and doing stratified type analyses, looking at, you know, uh, more pronounced effects in communities that, uh, of color, those sorts of things in terms of air pollution and adverse birth outcomes. Um, I've also looked at kind of effect modification um, in using interaction terms in time series studies, looking at temperature, humidity, and you do see kind of like these, um, uh, you know, again, these are not controlled experiments, right? So, um, you know, you have to be mindful that effects are um, uh, not homogenous uh, among different population subgroups or under um, combined environmental conditions. Um, and so that's the way I've, you know, handled that through either stratification or uh, interaction terms. Um, but also I've done kind of uh, cluster analysis to see how the, the, the combination of factors come together spatially and uh, you know you, you do find really interesting patterns in terms of like traffic related air pollution um you, you do find that there's distinct mixtures that have a spatial gradient um and th those uh, traffic related air pollution mixtures have a differential effect uh, on um on adverse birth outcomes that's um, some ways that i've looked at the question of interactions thank you so i'm going to ask one more question and make a comment and then I'll turn it back to see why. So, um, <clears throat> you know, everything depends on the data that you collect. And there were some posters yesterday that say, gee, sometimes there's problems with the data <clears throat> and you have to investigate it. But I have uh, even a more provocative question. You know, are the location of the sensors, I'm just wondering, how is that determined? Because if they are, you know, are there very local effects? And if you are not putting sensors as a result of very local effects, are you then missing the possibility of these interactions and, and more heterogeneity uh, in, in the results? So, you know, how are the sensors located and have they ever been investigated and in experiments done to see whether they really are getting uh, at all of the heterogeneity and variability that may exist in the in the measures that you're taking. So I'll turn that over to the panel and those are gonna be my comments for now. I mean, I can, uh, I can jump here in here real quick. That's a really difficult question. Um, well, it's a simple, simple question to ask, a difficult question to answer. Um, but, you know, studies have been done to look at, um, you know, the further away sensors are, like monitors are from, uh, you know, uh, po your, your population of interest. There's a lot of, uh, a lot more uncertainty introduced into your analysis. So that's, so that's one impact that, that, that we already know about. So, um, uh, in addition, if you have a, a monitor that is far away from a source of pollution, 
um, you know, what you're going to be getting is more of a background and ambient and um, that monitor will not characterize that distinct uh, pollution profile, uh, you know, from the source. So, you know, it's, you know, we could imagine that's um, propagating some uncertainty in, uh, you know, when we try to say there's an effect, a dose response or exposure response relationship, um, you know, it, it, that exposure response relationship could vary based on the, like PM 2.5 is actually a mixture within itself. Um, and so uh, when we just call it PM 2.5, we're masking the fact that not all PM is created equal. So there is a bit of a, um, a misnomer and a bit of uh, uncertainty when we say people the absolute mass cases. Um, and so where your monitor is, Any other comments from the panelists? I forgot how to raise a hand in Zoom, sorry. Just go <laughs> ahead, just go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, it's a, it's, um, there, there's a lot of approaches that have been already, you know, used in studies of urban air pollution, right? So there's a lot we know um, uh, from those experience, experiences. When I first started working with wildfire smoke, uh, it was interesting to me that um, how seriously we have to consider values, particularly like when you have very few monitors, because um, I observed that you will have a lot more missing data if there's wildfire smoke. So this was 10, 15 years ago when there was not a lot of wildfire smoke. So looking into that further, you start we start noticing that uh, regularly, um, monitors will go down when they get saturated or they provide, you know, it's the concentrations were like way out of the range, right? Um, uh, so it, it's it's important to like not rely on single monitor or um, and, and particularly if you're in rural um, areas. But modern, you know, they we have a lot of sensors, we have satellite data um, and a lot of good work has been done to get um, better and better exposures. And for wildfire smoke and public health, it's the day-to-day -day variation, you know, that we are trying to capture. So same population, um, but then variation in the exposure on the, in the same population over time, right? have a comment for something um and uh anna so your your comment's interesting because you know what i think then is the following is for these population-based studies are the estimates of excess risk that you're seeing actually smaller than they really are because you have so much imprecision and heterogeneity and perhaps you're missing signals for a variety of reasons that are coming from uh the the sensors and so in fact the risk is even greater than what you are actually detecting in your studies. Has anyone ever sort of addressed that issue? Well, uh, I think Sarah Henderson. Um... Um, maybe I could jump in. I think Bob, when you mentioned the question is like what we call measurement error. So. Uh, ideally, when you study population exposure, the kind of ground truth would be the person's actual personal exposure at a day, you know, indoor, outdoor combined, uh, including your community, everything. However, in reality, when you rely on either ground monitoring station or local sensor, or this nowadays we have a lot of big data, machine learning, satellite driven ambient exposure, we have this. Uh, you know, gap from the ambient concentration level to the actual personal exposure level. So these uh, exposure measurement error, um, and depending on different error types, uh, we, we sometimes say, uh, if like you said, Bob, uh, we kind of using ambient concentration level that might underestimating the actual exposure contrast across people, though it will lead to uh, 
uh, and the estimation, but in other cases, it could overestimate it. Uh, and so in general, at the population level, what we see is more to the point that it underestimates the uncertainty of the range of exposures contrast. So in a way, it's kind of uh, in the kind of uh, underestimating the not of the magnitude, but accuracy of this exposure contrast. So when we have the exposure response functions, we'll have the central estimates and the confidence intervals. So likely uh, what we see in some cases is that you will have a wider range of confidence intervals. So, so I think that that's uh, what the previous studies has shown. And on the other hand, when, when we talk about the, the uh, measurement error, it depending on whether you are using a short-term uh, time series study or long-term cohort study. Sh short-term time series really relies on the daily variation as an asset. So uh, for example, PM25, which may be relatively more hom homogeneous compared to uh, traffic-related pollutants like nitrogen uh, dioxide or uh, ultrafine particles, that if you rely on uh, CT level average uh, level of PM25, that may well capture that daily variation in time series analysis compared to if you are looking at the traffic related pollutants, whether you're using a modern station that can reflect traffic pollution or the ground, the urban background in, for example, in a park, then you could have a large difference in the exposure environment error. Then uh, that could lead to differential impacts on house estimates. So what I'm saying, trying to say is the different ways that it can impact the range of that impacts all, also vary depending on study design and uh, uh, the pollutants itself. Thank you. Any, any others uh, have a comment about that question? Okay, if, if not, I, I wanted to just uh, say a few final comments. Number one, thank you for uh, all the presentations, they're really wonderful. I wanna say to the audience that uh, what you saw this morning was really a very robust discussion of many issues that you know I could spend classroom sessions on. Uh, for example, the issue about robustness of, of the results using machine learning. Um, I, I was taking some notes, looking at the model, the out of sample. I mean, that's just a mention, but actually, why do you do that? It's because you want to examine the robustness of the result. You want to have some kind of scientifically valid result, which requires, you know, replication of the results. I mean, so there are a lot of issues uh, that were there. It was overwhelming for me, um, uh, the amount of of subtlety and important uh, issues that were raised during the presentation. So um, I, I may have absorbed about uh, you know ten percent of it, which I think is a pretty good morning for me. Um, <clears throat> but I, I do want to say that there was a lot there, and and again I'll just go back to my where I started, which is the difference between well-controlled experiments that you saw yesterday, and and I think they're. E at least for me, they're easier to interpret because you don't have a lot of these extraneous factors and heterogeneity and all kinds of other issues to consider. Whereas today, what you saw were observational studies, much more messy, difficult to do, uh, but equally uh, important. But um, again, coming from a school of public health, the reason I'm here is because I enjoy what the School of Engineering here is doing in terms of providing the information that then is used by a different set of professionals to examine. Uh, so you're each looking at issues of importance on your own, but I like seeing the intersection of, of these two coming together uh, for important discussions. And again, you know, even relating to uh, Dr. Fauci's testimony this morning and the comments or yesterday in the comments by the Wall Street Journal, I know Dr. Fauci, he's the straightest guy that you can imagine. And, uh, you know, to see that somehow uh, there was no basis for that. And here you are sitting this morning and you're listening to all the reasons that, in fact, there is a lot of information that's available for looking at this from a policy point of view. So uh, I want to thank all the speakers because it was really 
you know, really puts it hopefully for all of you in a nice perspective about seeing what you do and, and what your career in the future will become in, in different ways that people pursue, you know, their own passions. So uh, I, I just wanted to thank the panelists. Okay, uh, meanwhile, we still have some time. So any question, comments from the audience? Yes, Dr. Lee? Hi. Um, so I think that uh, right now, Research, uh, uh, the research about mass is pretty narrow, but uh, what kind of uh, what knowledge we have known right now that we can use that during a non pandemic period? And what will, for example, the next generation of mass will be in your mind? Mm -hmm. I had a little trouble hearing that. Was that a question about masks? Yes, yeah, a question about masks. So, uh, uh, I think there are two points. One is uh, the knowledge that we learned from these uh, mass testing uh, assessment. How can we use them in a non-pandemic time, right? And the second question is, uh, what does the future mask look like or the research direction really the uh, next generation of mask? Okay. Um, the, I guess I'll go for the second one first. Um, the thing about masks is people don't like them because they're, they're uncomfortable, you know, they're a hassle to wear. And from a scientific standpoint, the problem is, is a lot of the face masks that are worn don't work that well. So I think the future is going to be masks that fit better and that filter better, that are more comfortable. And hopefully if you can address those issues, people will be more likely um, to wear them. In terms of um, non-pandemic uses in the future, you know, unfortunately, masks would help even just like now, for example, you know, when we're seeing an uptick in respiratory diseases, but people you know, really don't like to wear them. And so it's it's hard to know if that's going to change or not. I think you see more of it now than you used to, but it's hard to know what's going to happen moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Coming? Yes. Shruti, can, actually, do you mind come over here? I have a question for Dr. Anna Rapol. So you mentioned about uh, science outreach. And then initially in your slides, you also mentioned about the socioeconomic differences. So when it comes to doing science outreach, uh, how would you uh, decide the framework of the science outreach? Because let's say if I am going to a household who can afford everything, and if I say them that, hey, we can use purifier or very nice, uh, very high exchange rate, air purifies everything. But then the same thing I cannot suggest to a household which might not be uh, having a nice income. So how would you like uh, make decide the framework for sound science outreach in such scenarios? Thank you. You know, um, are you familiar with uh, our Smoke Sense Citizen Science Project? Um, in Smoke Sense, it's a, a citizen science project that's facilitated on the application that brings a lot of like resources about wildfire smoke um, to the people. And they can interact with the information and they also report their observations of smoke and their health symptoms and so forth. And one of the, one of the things, main, main conclusions of the first phase of the study was that people were very interested in participating and learning about smoke, but the particip but it was about responding to the symptoms um, rather than preventing symptoms. So, you know, and on, in the second phase of the study, we studied what are the people's perceptions of the risk, right, um, and where they fall out. So there's five kind of stages that are usually classified of the change in behavior. One. One is that you're in denial of an issue. So you're not familiar with the issue. You don't think the issue is, um, is um, pertinent to you. Then you have these stages of like people who are contemplating, people who have already decided on, the, on an issue just need a clue, right? Um, so wherever people are, it doesn't matter on what, what socioeconomic uh, level they are. I think it, education matters, but um, they will um, fall 
in all five of the of the spectrums. Um, maybe not equally, right? But they will fall, like young young people will not fall in the vulnerable group. They will not perceive themselves as being vulnerable. Um, so um, it's how I think the best way to approach uh, communicating science is to understand what their perceptions of risks are and what are the competing uh, competing factors, right? If you are talking about existential problems, um, those are very diff you would address those through communication in a very different way than you would um, with someone who has all the means but just needs to go out there and buy that air filtration. So maybe looking into into that literature on you know perceptions uh, of risk and self-efficacy um, could provide you. I don't know what what population um, or you can email me later um, what population you're actually thinking about interfering with. You. you. Um, it's uh, it's uh, eleven thirty. So uh, this is, we are going to conclude our sessions. I would like to uh, thank the speakers again. And, and we are going to start the lunch and the poster session. And don't forget to come back for the afternoon session. Uh, and our speakers are all here in person uh, instead of Zoom. So please uh, come back. And, and now please enjoy the uh, lunch and the poster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, thank you again. Do you stop recording or? Okay. Yeah. Record and future operations suggest that there is a shift to the global south. As you can see in 2015, the red line, there is gradual shift to the global south. And so a significant portion of future emission affecting global atmosphere composition may come from Africa. And hence, we need to understand these emissions not just for the effect on Africa, but for the entire world and what they mean to the global climate. Then the other factor is, as you can see, is the demographic change in Africa. This, are, this is a projection of the mega cities in the world by 2100. And 13 of the world's mega, 20 mega cities are going to be in Africa by 2100. And by 2050, Africa will be home for half of the young people in the world. By 2100, one in every three on earth will be an African. And those cities by 2100, 13 of the world's largest cities, including Khartoum, as big as 57 million, Lagos, up to 8, 8 million and so on. So this huge population explosion and urbanization taking place in Africa. And the historical global emission trends are also showing, showing here. All of these emissions will occur in the tropics, the high relative humidity impact on oxidation and radiative forcing may be much larger compared to the mid latitudes. So that's very critical to understand the effect of the tropics on global atmospheric chemistry. And in the past, there's are the past uh, field studies that were conducted in Africa. As you can see, there is nothing done in East Africa. So my focus in this work is going to be mostly in East Africa. So what the challenges are, of course, successful air quality management requires that we measure the pollution levels, but also require information about the source and their relative importance. So most of the work that's being done in Africa right now is low cost sensor concentration measurements. And these are sketchy and they're not sporadic, so nobody knows. We don't have any source apportionment or the chemical composition of those emissions. And so there is lack of capacity, human and capital infrastructure. So there is a need to build the capacity for the research and human capacity in the region to address this global threat. And of course, there is, of, there is logistical issues are cited by most US and European scientists 
and this challenge must be addressed. And my uh, my argument towards that in conducting all the workshops and the meetings is to suggest that there are quite a number of diaspora elements in the US that could be connections to the African continent to minimize the challenges that come from logistics and administrative problems. And there is this is a from the Purple Air webpage. As you can see, the distribution of monitors in Africa is very safe. So there isn't much that's going on in that region. Uh, lack of data. So I'm just going to give you some of the ongoing activities in East Africa. I have a project with the University of Botswana International University of Science and Technology where I take students every summer. We do, uh, we take black carbon measurement using uh, ethylometer, small and handheld ethylometer. We take purple air, we take filter sampling. So we collect ethylon <laughs> filters for chemical analysis. We have homemade sound photometers to measure AOD and so on. So this is actually mostly undergraduate and graduate students that spend five weeks in Botswana. This has been going on the last three polls in 2022. <clears throat> we have a funding, this is joint collaboration with Columbia University from the State Department. This is actually intended to develop air quality management training courses in East Africa. And so these are visitors from Kenya visiting my campus last year. And we had a course that was offered at Kenya University for one week. So two of my, co my colleague and myself were part of the instructors and some people attending. These are air quality practitioners in East Africa that took the course. In June 8 to 11, we had a virtual, because of COVID, we had to be virtual. This is the city of the, the map, the picture of Addis Ababa in bright daylight. You can see the small. So we had a workshop, uh, a pilot design for air quality in Africa focused on Ethiopia. That was followed by an in-person workshop in Kigali. This is at the Carnegie Mellon University campus in Kigali and about uh, 80 people from Israel, Europe, the US attended this meeting. And the outcome of this meeting led to another workshop in Chapel Hill in September which was organized by Will Lizuete at UNC Chapel Hill and myself. And this was to, add, to develop a proposal addressing African equality, the, work, the purpose of the workshop. This was followed by a very recent workshop in Addis Ababa. This was uh, Together for Clean Air in Ethiopia. This is funded by the Swedish Research Council, organized by London University and myself. And this was at Addis Ababa University for the three day conference. So ongoing activities since the Kigali workshop, we have formed uh, four uh, air quality working groups in Addis Ababa, Nairobi, Kampala, and Kigali. Uh, we are working on a proposal, improved air pollution forecasting for Africa. This is a joint UK-US proposal that will be submitted in March. And then we're also working on a potential STC involving uh, in my Harvard, NCA, UK, uh, UNC chapter B, and uh, Colombia. So the goals of the potential field intensive campaigns are listed in here. I don't have to go through the list. That's the scientific objectives of this effort. And so hopefully funded, we plan to have an air campaign in Nairobi and Addis Ababa in 2027. So we're in the process of installing non based measurements, and there's also the Maya project, which is a jet ended project that has Addis Ababa as one of the target cities. And because of that, they have been installing a number of research grade uh, instruments. And uh, <coughs> the Sparta network for collecting filter samples also collects filter samples in Addis Ababa and Johannesburg. So, in my lab, uh, since 2012, I'm applying spectroscopic techniques. The focus is to measure optical and physiochemical properties of biomass burning aerosols from African biomass fuels. In the laboratory, we try to explore the impact of relative humidity, aging, burning conditions, morphology on optical and chemical properties, measure emission factors of pollutants because there hasn't been any 
Inve chemical inventory for the region is lacking completely. Most models use uh, information from Europe and the US to do air quality and climate models in Africa. Uh, we do model health impacts of biomass burning and trash burning in Africa. This is the most uh, modeling work. Understand the impact of climate and air quality. We do modeling work, so try to extract refractive index of the aerosols from measurements using T metrics and RDG theory. This is mostly what my physics students do, and also try to determine fractal dimensions. And field studies we participated in winter, Firex, and some international. Actually, the, we just had a paper on Firex emission factors from fires, which was dedicated to my for my 70th birthday. <laughs> So these are the fuels that we collect in Africa. I, these are the representation because how, how I get them here, I don't have to tell you that, but these are the different types of fuels collected in Botswana, East Africa. We get, we just have use small samples to do the burning. I'll explain the experiments I'll set up shortly. So since we started this work, and, and Jason, I mean, Damon Smith is the one who actually builds the chambers that I'm going to explain. We started burning some East African fuels to, to measure optical and chemical properties. That's actually published in SCP, two consecutive papers. One does chemical analysis, one depending on optical properties. And the characterization of the smoke chamber is in the aerosol and air quality research paper. And we do the modeling work. These are, these are undergraduate students and graduate students is to make T-metrics are needed to extract refractive indices. And this is actually work by one of my undergraduate students who is now at Carnegie Mellon in this PhD. Uh, the modeling work is a collaboration with Colorado State, Jeff Pierce and Emily Fisher, our collaborators. Jenica did modeling of this work. This is already published. The effect of trash residential biomass fuel on health outcomes in Africa. So the setup for our optical property measurements consists of, so I start, we start burning fuels in a tube furnace. So we don't have any open burning facilities. So I'll explain how, what the advantage of using a tube furnace in a, in a minute. And so the emissions from the tube furnace are introduced into the chamber. These are the UV lamps, so we can do photo aging, dark aging. We inject oxidants, and so we do measurements under oxidation conditions. We humidify the chamber, so we create the natural environment of the tropics in the lab, so we can sample the particles using uh, uh, DMA, SMPS, and we use cavity ring down to measure extinction, an ethnometer to measure scattering. We also have an ethnometer to measure the absorption, we have an SSM to, to, SSM to measure the or inorganics, and ATM actually measures the mass. Uh, so the tube furnace, when ignition starts, looks like this the inside of the tube furnace. This is the chamber while it was under construction, or it's enclosed. So I'll skip this. So the advantage of the tube furnace, as you can see, this is a violin plot of the burning conditions and MCE. So we have the MCE. So in this study, we can access, we can dial into a specific modified combustion efficiency. We can really control the burning condition. So it's not pure, mostly flaming as in the previous experiments, but we have both moldering and flaming and anything in between can be accessed through this system. And so we can also see the colors of the emission. So yellow, brown carbon, black carbon, depending on the oven temperature. So we have calibrated the oven temperature to a specific MCE by measuring the CO2 from the furnace. And this is the size distribution in the flaming dominated region. This is a TM image of the fractals that we observe. When it is smoldering fire, we have more or less spherical properties. And uh, the white line indicates the evolution of the geometric mean diameter of the distribution. So this is the, the whole experimental setup with all the gadgets involved in the project. 
the optical part consists of a Young laser and an OPO. This is from my previous life when I did spectroscopy, so I transferred it to this world. We have the cavity ring down system. And this is a very effective technique, very sensitive technique where light is trapped and bounced back and forth. So you measure the decay with and without the sample to get the extinction. And uh, so we have this in, in your smoke chamber. And so, so we collect filter samples. This is done at the UNC biomarkers facility where the, we do ultra performance liquid chromatography and electrospray in the positive and the negative mode. So this is where the chemical analysis is done. So we collect filter samples. These are the, to get the atmospheric relevance of what we do in the lab, we also collect filter samples as I showed you from Botswana to do the chemical analysis. So some of the results we also work with a group at Los Alamos, the CAPE group, because they have more uh, sophisticated instruments. So we go there to calibrate our instruments and we conduct, some, we take the same fields that we measure in our lab at Los Alamos for calibration. And this is also part of the chemical analysis at UMC. So we do GCMS analysis as well. So some of the work, the results, this is one of the earlier work by Rudra, a postdoc in my group, who's now working for the, I think, Colorado Environmental Office. So this is, uh, the, the main outcome of this work is really, we were able to determine the fractal dimension for different regions of the burning condition for smoldering. The fractal dimension is almost three. And for the flaming stage, the fractal dimension is almost 1.8, 2.2 or so in, the, in that range. This is anything in between. So this allows you, we propose that the relationship between the mass mobility exponent and MCE can serve as a way to determine when methane is applicable and when methane is not applicable. So that's the main message of this work. We do emission factors of pollutants from biomass burning of African fuels in the laboratory measurements. These are some of the results, as you can see, are the different fuels that we used from Africa. Eucalyptus is a very common fuel in Ethiopia. Only white pine, more pain, white pine is local actually. So more pain, Wanza, all others are African fuels. So it has a very little fuel dependence for any species was observed. CO and CO2 emission factor show stronger dependence on MCE, that's the modified combustion. Efficiency that tells you the burning condition. Oops. And there is some correlation between CO, no, uh, the next one. Particulate matter and CO emission factors are highly sensitive to burning conditions of the fuel, but there is also a correlation, which if we need repeated experiments to confirm this, that CO can be used as a surrogate to determine the emission factor of PM in some cases. So fuel nitrogen content also plays a significant role in the emission factor of nitrogen oxide in this work. Uh, we also do, these are the students that did this work. This is again work in aerosol science and technology. We did, how much time do I have? So I'll just skip this work. This is just measuring hydroscopicity. So we had a CNC counter that was borrowed from Aquas lab in Maryland. And we, we measure change in uh, en en enhancement factor for using the cavity. So with, with moisture at high humidity and dry conditions. So we actually used extinction hydroscopicity growth factor was what we measure. We compare it with the, the measurements done using CCMC. And we use these two uh, empirical equations to determine PAPA, the hygroscopicity factor for two fuels. And I'll uh, skip this. So this is just to give you an idea of what the outcome of this work was. So basically, the, the main outcome of this is instead of using a humidified Nephrometer or cavity, we had the chamber that's humidified. So 
that would be applicable to natural environments, aerosols are in tropical regions. And so it's one of the activities. And finally, I'll just go through. This is a time series of the experiment that shows you what have the, the time of and the, 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 the fuel is introduced at 9 p.m. And then this is these are the times when sampling is done. So this is fresh sampling, and we let it sit for some time. So this is dark aging. And then we wait for we turn on the UV, and this is for the aging. So this is the time series, and then you can see the change in RH in the CO, CO2 mass, mass concentration and temperature change during the, the full day of an experiment. So each experiment takes place a full day, it's a full day task. So we have to sample it under different conditions. The other only condition we have is we inject uh, oxidants. And so under oxidant, uh, with, with the presence of oxidants, we also try to see the photochemistry and measure optical properties under this. This is oxidation experiment. Again, this is a time series. So some of the results, this is, uh, we measured the extinction emission factor uh, for different fuels. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, the mass extinction coefficient uh, for dry and humid conditions. And this is the uh, effect of photo aging on MC, uh, mass, mass scattering coefficient. So you can see the change in the presence of, uh, I think that's the sort A. Uh, effect of oxidation on dark aging. So you can see the difference between the dark age, the photo age. Fuse. This is a change in the MCE, MBC, that's modif uh, mass extinction coefficient. So basically, this graph actually shows that by pl plotting Angstrom, absorption Angstrom coefficient as a function of scattering Angstrom coefficient, mm -hmm. we can determine the source of our uh, aerosols. So most of those happen to be biomass in this region. For the molecular level analysis, we actually use filter samples, absorbance, and molecular composition of methanol soluble. Optimized chromatographic electroionization. We analyzed about 25 samples. We used about 100 authentic standards for this measurement. And the uh, Botswana samples were collected in this region. So I'll just keep that I already mentioned this. So this shows you the mass absorption coefficient of the African solid fuels. This is a dashed line in the color and the African solid fuels others. That's, these are the leaves, cow dung, and branches. So there's a big difference in the mass absorption coefficient. So that shows uh, a dependence on the fuel type. And then we are comparing this with the measurements that done using the, for, for a Switzerland fuel measured under different conditions. This is uh, impress, this, this work is actually under public interest in environmental science and technology, which will be coming out soon. Uh, this effect of humidity on photo aging on the bulk fuel specific mass absorption coefficient. As you can see, primarily dry emission, high MSC values at low wavelengths. That's this one. And and the wavelengths 1.4 times in the humid chamber. This is the ratio between the dry and the humid. On the left panel, we are comparing the photo edge to primary. And then the, you can see that the, there is a photo edging reduces the mark by 20%. It's much lower than what it was in here. And but on the other hand, it increased by 1.5 at around 4, 4, 50 nanometers or longer. So there is a shift in the mark between the photo edge primary and the dry and humidified. This is uh, the characterization of uh, brown carbon by Sally and Dan. And so where our fuel, the brown, the light absorbing properties of brown carbon. So these are the 
absorption angstrom exponent for the fuels that we burn it in our lab. The, the, the African biomass hardwood, this is a, all other fuels. They all lie in the weakly to moderately absorptive region. This shows the, the, the mass closure analysis and contribution to PM mass. And so these are all lab generated samples and the one in the lower panel are the field generated samples. So just to give you an idea, two, two thirds of the total identified brown carbon mass corresponds to species which match with authentic standards of coumarins, steel beans, and flavonoids and make up 10 to 20% of the identified brown carbon mass. Uh, nitro aromatics are negligible in primary, but contribute to 30 to 40% in, uh, in the ambient samples that were collected in Botswana. And the other major conclusion is for primary emissions, combined brown carbon species, uh, total mass of about 20. I can see that from here. If I should read it from here. 7% of the total aerosol mass reduced in the presence of relative humidity and uh, I mean, in the, in the problem of photo aging. This is a chromatograph uh, of the GCM, GCMC analysis. Just go through this very quick. These are the different species, the percentage of the different species. I just want to emphasize the cosine is uh, a, a marker of biomass burning. It's present in most of the species. But I want you to pay attention to the particle depend on is what really is the key element here. This was found only in specific biomass fields in Africa. So that suggests that this could be one of the potential markers for African biomass burning. And so depend on as a possible African biomass burning tracer due to familiar relations between plant species and field sample analysis. So that's just the type of message from here. Uh, yeah. I, I just want to thank my group and the funding agencies for this. Actually, BIOS is a postdoc from ETH Zurich, and so it's partially funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. Since I may not be around for the question, if there's any question, I can Yeah, I was just yeah. going to say that yeah. Professor Billigan needs to leave. That's around 3 30, so I may not be around yeah. for the panel. Yeah. So, if there's any questions, this, this is, would be the time. Yeah. So I have a question regarding the the second derivative of so formation from the biomass burning because I think there were quite a lot of inconsistency regarding the field method measured secondary aerosol and then the lab measured secondary yeah. aerosol even regarding the mass whether the mass is increasing or decreasing. So from your lab study, what did you find? Find like secondary aerosol. There is a there is secondary organic aerosol formation as well. Uh -huh. yeah, so that increases the mass. Yeah. Even in the dark aging conditions, you have observed the, 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 the close of secondary organ Can you repeat? One? Yeah, I'm not sure everybody yeah. heard the question and the answer. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can go there. Yeah, yeah you can just yeah. summarize. Yes. Yeah, so my question is related to the secondary aerosol formation from biomass burning. Yeah. So because there are inconsistencies regarding field measure secondary aerosol and then the lab measure secondary aerosol. And due to this dilution effect, some people find that the, the total aerosol mass is decreasing as we form secondary aerosols. So your finding shows yeah, yeah. actually we, we, there's a... We, we observe secondary organic aerosol formation, especially in the dark. Especially area. in the dark yeah. aging yeah. condition. Okay, thank you. Can you repeat one more time what's dark aging? Dark aging is basically you just leave the aerosols in the chamber. Why is that? And we don't turn the light off on and the room light is turned off. But for, for that graph, so yes. is combustion still ongoing during this process? No. So we the combustion takes only a few minutes. Oh, okay. And then the 
gas and the fuel is injected into the chamber and we keep uh, uh, clean air into the chamber to keep the concentration. And so basically it's it's not a collapsible chamber. So we need to keep that. It's, we operate the chamber in batch, in batch mode, fixed volume. So once we insert it, then we can sample using different instruments. So typically about 0.5 grams of wood would be enough to generate enough mass concentration in the chamber for all the instruments. So sometimes we even have the liquid water sampler, mist chamber sampler is included in the mix. So we have so many instruments that are pulling and the chem, of course, the filter sampling is taking place. We have the cavities pulling some because we have to measure extinction, scattering the nephrometers, pulling some. So, so adding on to that, have you looked at the size distribution of the particles? Yeah, so we use SNPS and we follow the size distribution. So and how much is the shift in the size of the particles? Uh, not very much. I could check the exact values, but the, the, there is some coagulation taking place and particle growth. So there is a shift in the size distribution with time, but it's not very significant. Earlier, so, we did mostly size selected studies, but now we're just measuring the whole. So. So we should move on, but I do know I have one question. Yeah. What is the most surprising or interesting thing you've learned? Because you've done so much, so many lab experiments, yeah. and there, um, I'm sure you've looked at past literature. Yeah. So the chemical analysis was the most significant. We identified 182 different uh, chemical species in the brown carbon. Yeah. So that's so the most uh, most significant one. Yeah. So there's yeah, one more one question more from question. Oh, and, uh, from the team. Oh, on the one So the question is, what is the impact of inorganic species on the organic fraction of aerosol formation? Is there a synergistic effect? The impact of inorganic species. Yeah, so we, we've been co co collecting, uh, we've been measuring the inorganics using SSM, but that work is not yet fully analyzed, so I, I cannot answer that yet. Okay. Yeah. But there's a graduate student working on SSM, and she, she conducted similar work at using the MS at Los Alamos, so we might have some good results coming up. All right, well, thanks again. Thank you. Next speaker is Professor Karen Arden Dreyer, and her talk will be on identification measurements of dust events and the impact of the dust on air quality and human health. And can you use that way? Yeah, they can hear when it's the top one. Oh, it's the top one. I guess that would really be that could be good. Oh, here it should be good. But it was a top one. Share the screen. And then make it call. This one? No sound. Uh, not yet. So let me share the screen. Okay. So is it? Oh, okay. It's over there. Uh, let me try share again because it's different from what we got before. Um, why is it showing the other one? Oh, because you can see, yeah. yeah. Or did I duplicate or you can do switch. Yeah, I can do duplicate and then hide this floating you can control but yeah now we're good yeah hello uh good afternoon everyone 
Thank you so much for uh, inviting me today. It's a big pleasure and honor to come to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is dust. If you want to know why I love dust? Ask me later. I'll let you know. It's kind of an interesting story. Um, so <clears throat> my background is very different. I started in geography, moved to cloud physics, went to biology, and now I'm in Texas Tech University doing uh, a work about dust. And today I'm going to talk about um, how do we identify dust? What is the impact that dust have on our life living in a place, especially some of us live in Lubbock, Texas, which has a lot of dust. And I'll start just with a really brief. I mean, if you've been here for several days, you know what particulate matter ours. You know what PM 2.5 and PM 10. I just want to keep that in your mind because I'm going to talk about these things from a measurement perspective. And just to remind you, I'm going to talk about the natural aspect of dust. I'm not talking about this kind of dust. I'm talking about dust events that are formed in the atmosphere. And dust have a huge impact on our life. From impact on agriculture, destroying baby corn, to suffocation of the animals, to impact on our health, and we'll touch about that to the impact on cloud formation and precipitation. I spent seven years doing, six years doing that in my PhD, to car accidents, to aviation issues, impact on economic. So dust has a big impact on many aspects of our life. What is dust? A meteorological phenomenon that is very common in arid and semi-arid environment, when basically we have strong winds that uplift particle into the air. And you can identify it very easily if you just pick up your eyes from your phone and just watch your surrounding. We just want to look at the, the uh, visibility. And these are two locations, one in Lubbock, one in Israel, where I did my PhD. And when you can't see, when something is blocking your view and you can't see for a distance, there's particle in the air. And in our case, it would be dust particles. And dust is uh, impacting on our air quality, impacting on our life. And it's common in so many places, even here in the US. And we sometimes underestimate the impact of dust have. So Sahara is our biggest source of dust particles. And particles don't have boundaries. They don't care where they come from. They move in the atmosphere. And sometimes if we talk about the US, we get dust from Sahara. We get dust on the West Coast from Asia, but we also have some of our locals. And these are the kind of stuff we're going to see today. Now, before we talk about dust, there's like several basic names and, and definition I have to put on the table to make sure when you leave this room, you'll know the difference between them. And you'll see this confusion in the media as well. Dust event versus dust storm. According to the World Meteorological Organization, a dust event will be defined as a meteorological event and when dust particles are in the air, when they reduce the visibility below 10 kilometers. A dust storm would be a severe dust event when the visibility will be reduced by less than one kilometer. This is my student driving. Uh, in February in Lubbock. We'll see some of the measurement from this dust event, dust storm, I should say. All right, so this is the definition, dust storm versus dust event. Another definition that I'm sure you've seen in the media, sandstorm versus dust storm. Two different things. We're talking about different sizes of particles and the impact they will have vertically on the atmosphere will be different. If you've been in the ocean and you walked and you felt like something was hitting your leg, these were sand particles, large particles that can be uplifted into the atmosphere. But if you walked and you saw some plume of dust, I don't know if anyone, anyone of you have seen this thing, we'll talk about it in a second. These are dust particles, much smaller, have the ability to be uplifted to higher altitude in our atmosphere. So sandstorm versus dust storm. How do they form? So the biggest thing we need is wind. If we don't have strong winds, the particle would not be able to move. So in order to have strong winds, we would need to have atmospheric instability. We'll talk about the two meteorological causes 
that can lead for that, for strong winds to occur. But physically, what happened? We need to have bare soil. Because in those bare soil, we might have particles of different sizes. And as the wind starts to move, and basically push those particles and move them, we're going to have a different phenomenon. We're going to have creep, which would basically be strong particles that sort of move on the ground, saltation, which I'll show you this little video. In this process, we have particles that hit the ground, and the minute they hit the ground, they uplift other particles. And we also have suspension. These are the small particles that will be able to uplift into the air. So all these phenomena are happening happening at the beginning. This is how the dust starts. It starts from the creep, saltation, and then the suspension of these smaller particles that can travel, as you probably heard in the first day, smaller particles can travel for longer distance. So what meteorological condition we need to form this strong wind that will start to move these particles and suspend them in our atmosphere? There's actually two big meteorological conditions. A synoptic scale, which is a large scale meteorological phenomenon like front, low pressure system. This would be a strong event, larger area that will cause this wind. And when we have this strong wind, especially if it pass over an agriculture area where we have uh, a bare and dry land, some of these particles might be able to uplift in the earth. This might last for hours, days. Another phenomenon is a convective dust event. Have you heard the term kabu? Some of you are not, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's okay, you'll get to see them. This is a kaboot. A kaboot is, is a word from South Arabia that came to the US when American troops were deployed in the Gulf War, the first one. Um, and this is very common meteorological phenomenon where basically you have thunderstorm, as precipitation come down, they evaporate, and they cause basically strong wind that hit the ground and it needs to go somewhere. So it goes to the side. And as it goes from the ground to the side, it uplifts the particle into the air and it sometimes causes this wall of dust. We love to call here in the US, kabu. Basically, it's saying dust in another language, but you'll hear it a lot. All right, so these are the two main meteorological conditions that can cause dust. And they might be different from place to place in the US. And they might be different in their impact on air quality. And there might be impact on when they're going to be caused. But sometimes we have a mixture of these things. This is February 2021. We have a khaboob. You're going to oops, see the khaboob on the ground. This was taken by one of our students. This is the khaboob here, the convective dust storm. And this is the yellow part that you see here is the synoptic. A combination of these two, very rare, like it happened, like it happened once in a million years or a hundred, it happened, <laughs> just that we don't really have a lot of measurements. In this case, there were no sensor to collect these events. And you'll see later on, we're trying, we're really trying to capture them. So these can happen, a combination of these two meteorological conditions. So how do we measure them? Just as a brief, we had a poster. Tamidayo uh, is uh, working on this project. This is a new NSF grant that we got to create a database for dust event and dust storm from the US. We don't really know how much dust do we have. Are all places in the US equal when it comes to dust? No. Our places have more convective uh, com compared to synoptic. We don't know. Hopefully in three years, we'll have an answer. But how do we do this work? And this is how we can identify these dust events. We have thousands, close to 2,500 2, meteorological stations across the US. We call them METAR or S. These are automated stations that has measurement 
of meteorological condition, temperature, relative humidity, dew point, wind speed, wind gusts, visibility, pressure, precipitation. Some of them have a weather observer. Usually they're located at the airport and the majority of the work is done to basically alert the plane. Can they land, not land? But most of the station are automatic because it costs money to have an observer and they have to go outside to check the measurement every hour. So mm -hmm. they're doing a lot of work. But this is a very interesting aspect that we have in this association. Presently, weather report. It's telling us what are the conditions currently. Is there a thunderstorm? Is there fog? Is there haze? Is there dust? This is how it looked like. This is the code that we get from this weather station. And what we do is we take those meteorological conditions and we look at them. And we're trying to follow the WMO and identify a dust event based on did the visibility increase above six meter per second? This is the first wind speed that starts to have saltation. Remember, this is one of the basic movement of these particles in the ground. The second thing is, if we want to follow WMO, do we reduce the visibility below the 10 kilometer? So here in the figure at the top, you can see in black how the visibility decreases and how in red, the wind speed increases. We also look, what was the weather code that was reported at the time of this observation? Uh, the weather observer can put 20 codes. I can tell you that we also found a lot of mistakes. So we have to be very careful when we analyze the data. BLDU, blowing dust. DU, suspension dust. DS, dust storm. These are all put manually. Haze, HZ, can be put manually on an, and automatic. In a lot of the automated stations, this is what we see, haze. But then we have to go and be careful in every event and identify, is this really haze, anthropogenic pollution, or is this a natural dust event. And this is what Tommy Dyer is going to do. So just at the beginning, we'll see. Um, but we have done work and we already identified dust in Texas and dust in Arizona. And I can tell you, we see a big difference between the two locations in terms of when dust happened, how it impacts on air quality, what kind of dust occur, when it occur, over the year, over the month. But another aspect that we do and put an emphasis is the impact on air quality. How do we know what's the impact of dust on air quality? The easiest way to do is to look on the concentration of particle. How much PM 2.5 we have and how much PM 10 we have. We have uh, more than 1,000 PM sensor across the US, EPA sensor. There's additional uh, uh, network that uh, you can use, but all of them have advantage and disadvantage. So here, I just put the map of the 2020 uh, sensor that I found on EPA website. These provide hourly average PM 2.5 and PM 10. And we can see two examples. We had one dust event that both PM 2.5 and PM 10 increase. And we have another dust event that only PM 10 increase. PM 2.5 remain low. This tell us something about the location. We have a lot of small particle in the dust a lot of large particle in the dust. When we have both PM2.5 and PM10, we can calculate ratios, which is PM10 minus PM2.5, just take the maximum at the black one minus the maximum at the red one, or every hour, that will give you the top graph. And we can see when there's more of these PM10 minus PM2.5, we know there's a lot of coarse particles. We can also do a ratio, which is the ratio of PM2.5 divided by PM10. Normally, when we say when this number is below 0.3, we're talking about dust. If it's above 0.6, we talk about anthropogenic pollution. This is this February event that my student was driving. This is across Texas. This is the dip of seven different stations across Texas. So there were a lot of, lot of coarse, large particles. But let's start talking about some of the issues. Here's some two images. Uh, the pink one, uh, these are from GEO's uh, satellite, and the pink represents amount of dust. And you can 
see how this dust move in different locations over Texas, over Oklahoma, and those green dot or red dot are stations. EPA station. Problem is, there's a lot of places with no station. So if I live there, do I say no sense or no dust? It didn't happen. I didn't measure it, so it didn't occur. It's one of our problems. We don't have enough sensors to try to understand what's the impact of these dust on our health. None of the low-cost sensors we have now are good enough for dust. They're great for anthropogenic pollution and PM2.5 suck for PM10. So what can we do? We need to develop and maybe one of your brilliant boys and girls will be the next one who will develop the low-cost sensor that will be able to track dust. Talk to me. Um, but let me show you additional issues that we have. These are measurements of the dust that I collected during my PhD in Israel. We want to look at the impact on air quality. What do we do? We measure the PM10, we measure the PM2.5, and then we compare to the W Health Organization daily threshold and the EPA daily threshold. Huge concentration in, bl in blue of PM10, in red PM2.5. Oh, by the way, Israel is somewhere in the Mediterranean. You probably heard a lot of stuff about it in the news. Uh, but just so you know, there's a lot of dust in Way more than what we have. But if I just look at the daily values, I would say, oh, well, I'm way above the EPA and the World Health Organization, so it's very problematic. What about the U.S.? This is one of our kabooms from Lubbock. I'll let you first see the, the images. Here it comes. Drop the visibility to almost zero. This is the daily. We only have PM2.5 in Lubbock. This is our PM2.5 concentration. Really increased and went back down. What was the daily value? This below the EPA. So if I'm only looking at the daily value, I would not even think this day was problematic. It would just pass beyond my radar. Luckily, World Health Organization updated the threshold, but up until two years ago, this would day would also pass by the, the World Health Organization uh, values. Let me show you other issues. So we mask the daily value because of the fluctuation. These are two dust that we collected in Lubbock. So I didn't like the fact that we only had PM 2.5 sensor in our town. So I built my own station. And now we measure PM 1, 2.5, 10, but also side distribution. And I'll show you a few of the measurements of that in a few more seconds. So two dust to make. If I'm only looking at the daily values, you would assume that, oh, just this day, April, was problematic. This one didn't pass the EPA, but look at the sun radiation. We normally don't get to see the sun radiation. We only get to see the daily average. So you have to be very careful when you analyze your data and look at all your variables. And let me show you another thing that I did not really mention yet. These two dusts were very different in terms of how they caused. The April 10 was a synoptic. The April, the June 10 was a convective. It was a kaboom. Very short for them. And yet, such a high standard deviation. If I would only look at the daily average, I would say, oh, the synoptic day was much stronger. It had much higher concentration compared to the synoptic convective dust storm. But if you look at a shorter time scale, and this is something we have with our station, we can look at every minute. By the way, EPA only provides hourly values. I would not get to see short event. So using short minute, 10 minute average, you can see the concentration during this kaboom were much higher. People were exposed to much higher concentration compared to the synoptic. But this is not just the case for Lubbock. This is for Arizona. We were able to get raw data from uh, Maricopa County from multiple stations, 
And we've been playing with that and trying to look at the impact of convective events, which are the short duration event, uh, uh, the kabooms one on air quality. We have here at the top PM10, the bottom PM2.5. On the left, these are hourly average. On the right, 10 minute average. Exposure could be much more extreme in convective event. Now, if you're outside, you're gonna breathe those particles in. Once they're in, they're in. You're kind of stuck with them. And we'll see that in a second. But these are something we don't talk about. We don't think about. And we should start thinking about those things. Another issue that we have when dust. If you talk to people, they'll tell you, oh, dust, these are a large particle. You shouldn't worry. I want to show you that you should worry. These are measurements I took from home. So during COVID, we had to shut down campus. Basically, I took my station and moved it to the backyard. So it's my backyard. And I collected, I continued to collect measurement. Dust doesn't care. There's COVID, no COVID. It comes and goes. This were dust that came all the way from Africa. If you heard about the Godzilla dust, we had it in 2020. And it made it this way all the way from Africa to the US, with it to my house. And we were able to measure the, the size distribution, the concentration as a function of size of these particles. And in orange and yellow, based on back trajectories that show us where the dust came from, we can see dust made all its way from uh, Sahara. One thing is obvious, there's a lot of small particles in this dust. Remember the two dust events I just showed you two slides ago? Here they are again. Side distribution of the synoptic on the left, the convective, the short on the right. The black line at the top represents the side distribution at the peak of the dust, where the highest concentration was. And the light gray, basically the daily average, and the dark gray right before the dust occurred. Something obvious, there's a lot of more particles during the dust obvious, but there's a lot of small particle in the dust event. And you can look where the one micron stand, my, one micron just go directly into your bloodstream. A lot of small particles in dust. So if you hear someone tell you, oh, dust, large particle, tell them, well, there's a lot of small one as well. And that's the problem because these particles can penetrate deep into our lungs. So I wanna to touch a little bit about the health and health aspect that we do. Um, these are lung sample, lung tissue sample from American troops who were deployed in the Mediterranean, and you can see dust particles in their lungs. They were exposed to a lot of dust in the Mediterranean, and a lot of them came back home with health problems, respiratory problems. So how do we look at the impact of dust on health? We have heard in the earlier morning section a lot about epidemiological studies. Epidemiological studies are basically when we go to the doctor and we can get uh, information on how many people came to the ER after a dust event, uh, how many people gave birth early. It's a lot of statistical analysis. So this is just one of the way. And some of the becoming very hot topic when it comes to dust is uh, dust storm or thunderstorm asthma which are basically pollen particles that emit into the air as part of the dust, and valley fever, which is a fungi that's becoming a very hard disease. It feels like having a flu, but it's very catastrophic, and we don't see it everywhere. Well, truthfully, doctors are not supposed to report it everywhere, so that's why we don't see it. Again, it didn't happen, it didn't exist. Uh, this is an issue we have in Texas. Doctors are not obligated to report. So we don't know if we have valley fever in Texas or not. Doctor obligated to report in Arizona and New Mexico and California, we see hundreds, thousands of cases per year. And one of the issues, is these particles uplift in the air during dust event. So epidemiological studies are just one way to look at the health impact of dust. We can also expose particles to animals and look at that impact. Or we can expose animal to cell, majority human lung tissue cells, lung cells, 
to look at the impact on uh, health. And this is what we do in our group. The biggest issue when it comes to dust is that we don't have a conclusive cause and understanding of the impact on health. Some studies found that there is a, a, a health issue, other like it's not strong correlated. So we really wanna try to understand why and what is the true impact of these dust particle on health? And how do we do it? In our group, we're using a method that I developed as a postdoc, developed it by the state. One of the things I love about science. You start in one thing and you end up in another, and like, oh, this is something new. Um, so during my postdoc, I spent two years at Harvard Medical School. And what I was doing is I was looking at single cells, human lung cells. The group that I was in was trying to understand how cancer can be cured. And I was just trying to kill the cell with dust particles. But what can we do with this technique? We can monitor the behavior of each individual cell over time. We can identify the interaction the dust particles have with the cells. We can detect the exact time of death. And we can identify what type of death. And I'll show you some of some of very preliminary results just because of timing. So what's the problem? Why people have not done it before? You're gonna see here in a second, this is uh, a movie showing cells with the white stuff, these are the dust particles. And I know, can you see some movement? These are the cells that are trying to move. So this is a low concentration. If I wanna look at the video right now, I can identify the cells and I can identify what's happening with them. But this is a high concentration. Can you see the cells? It's very blurry. The particles mask the, the cells. So that was part of the problem that people have not done it before. So what we found to overcome this, we basically add a fluorescent protein into our nuclei of the cell. Um, for those of you who have not seen a cell or taking a biology class, the yellow part is the cytoplasm and the um, orange is the nuclei. This is where we have all the genetic information. So we add nuclei markers into our cell. And now, even if we block them with dust, we can still detect them and can still understand what's happening. So what are we doing? We look at these nuclei over time. If the cell remain alive, it will stay in its shape. It can divide, which is a normal mechanism we have. This is when you have a cut, your cell divide to try to close the gap. Um, or we see this. And we'll talk about in a second about these explosions. Explode. There you go. So obviously, the cell did not maintain its shape. It died. One thing we found is if we look at the cell nuclei and we add some particles, I want you to watch what the cell is doing. It's going to start take those particles. We call it engulfing or phytocytosis. And you start to see in a second that the nuclei starts to change. It's losing its shape. And the cell will basically die. All right. So the cell dies because it took some particles. We found a correlation. When the cell took more particles, it has a higher increase of dying. Look at the center. You'll see a lot of the cells that are engulfing these particles. My advisor used to call them human vacuum cleaning. <laughs> they would clean. But they're doing it in our body. They're trying to protect us. By the way, these cells are not supposed to do that. So we're still trying to understand why they're doing it. There are other cells in our body called microphage. This is their job. They're supposed to clean, but the literature tell us that during dust event, they're overwhelmed and they can't make their cleaning more efficient, which cause some of the cells to die because they're taking particles. But the interesting aspect is that with this cell the technique, we can identify if the cell remained alive or if the cell died. And we can also look at how they died. There are two mechanisms, main mechanism of cell death, one called apoptosis, another called necrosis. Apoptosis is basically when the cell is able to maintain all the material inside of it. And it create apoptotic body. Necrosis is a mechanism that basically the cell is overwhelmed. It's like too many particles. And what it does, explode. 
when it explodes, it releases the material from the cell into the bloodstream, which would cause inflammation, which could end in an asthma attack. So when we did this work with one type of dust, one type, we found that as we increase the concentration of particle, we see less of apoptotic, which means the cell can maintain its material, but not for long. Most of the cell, if you see the red, increase by necrosis. Most of the cell explodes. So we would expect to see a lot of inflammation, more asthma attack as we increase the concentration. But one of the issues is that dust comes from various places. It has different chemical composition and it can have different health impacts. These are, this is what's gonna be Gloria's project. She's gonna use the single cell. And we see that different material that come from Africa might have different toxicity, some toxic, some not. We're still trying to understand why. Because of timing, I'll left you with this. Right? <laughs> if you are interested working on dust, we have a dust organization, it's called DANA, Dust Alliance for North America. We have a call for paper. We have a webinar that we're hosting every month. And it's a great way to increase the community around North America, not just the US, for people who work on dust. So I encourage you, join our member, come to our seminar every month, second Friday of the month. And uh, we also have get together in conferences, which is always nice to talk to more people about dust. All right. So most of the stuff that you've seen today would not happen without the students who are doing the work. And these are just part of the students who are, uh, I was able to present some of the work. And of course, we thank the CH Foundation. They donated the microscope for us so we can actually do the single cell analysis. And NSF who believe in us that we can create this big database that we're hoping to share uh, freely so people can use it to understand really the impact on dust here in the US on human health. And to you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks. Isn't it fascinating? We'll have time for questions after the next two talks. So the next talk will be by Dr. Uh, Shan Hu Li on urban new particle formation in Houston. And I'll do the same thing. I'll, I'll stand up after twenty five minutes. <clears throat> this. Okay. Oh, Thank you. Thank you very much for introduction and uh, thank you for the invite. Very pleased to be here, I'm honored. And uh, so I wanted to uh, ch um, change, um, shift the gear from the very large size of PM2.5 to nanometer particle sizes, nuclei motor particles, uh, even uh, clusters. So these are newly formed particles. So my group is doing new particle formation studies. We do kinetic studies in the laboratory, and we also do a lot of field campaigns in urban areas and the forest and the coastal environments. But in this talk, I want to show you some of very recent work on published results we collected in Houston. So um, new particle formation. So new particle formation has two steps. First step is aerosolucleation, which is the formation of new clusters and the subsequent growth of clusters to aerosol particles. So why do we study new particle formation? Because new particle formation is the major source of secondary aerosols. So that's the particles are emitted primarily from emission sources, but new particles are formed either by nucleation or by secondary organic aerosol processes. And more importantly, air, new, new particle formation is a main source of global CCN cl cl cloud condensation nuclei. 
So what are the uh, new hospitality professional working there? And I completely in the air that we provide the customers in the game floor or the guest room or even a in restaurant. restaurant. <laughs> Why did my voice is So now we should be good because so you just uh, unmuted yourself, but now we should be good. Yeah. Right. Um. Uh, to break the ice, as I engage, as I like to engage you all into my uh, presentation. Uh, my name, Paul Sean Chang. Uh, can you imagine that what my family business is? H.F. Chang, P.F. Chang. Yeah, I wish I my family P.F. Chang, but uh, my name is H.F. Chang, uh, so that you can easily remember. Anyone ask me, oh, what do you, how do you spell your last name? I will always say, like P.F. Chang, because P.F. Chang is the brand name of uh, Chinese uh, chain restaurant operation in the United States. Um, what is it that hotels are trying to sell to the end uh, users, the customers? Uh, and hotels definitely, I'm sure that one third of you, uh, those who are uh, living in, in Miami, uh, you are spending eight hours at hotel rooms sleeping through the night. And that's the place that traveling public spend their most time when they're traveling. And as a hospitality uh, professional perspective, what exactly we are selling to our guests, or what exactly you are getting from overnight stay in a hotel? Uh, because of the uh, slide that I uh, bumped it through, you have seen my answer here. Yes, uh, our student would say, oh, we are selling memorable experience. But from our perspective, we're selling a good night's sleep. If they, our customers can't sleep through the night, there's no way we can welcome them back. They're not going to come back to a hotel, uh, sleep through the night. Why does sleeping is associated with well-being and health? Because without having a good night's sleep, our immune system will go down and our cognitive function not going to as sharp as it used to be. So clinical research indicated that, oh, carbon dioxide level in a bedroom will impact sleep quality. So one perfect study is the carbon dioxide level higher than 1,150 ppm will compromise the sleep quality in the bedroom. And there are more studies indicating that, oh, we have to control bedroom CO2 level. If don't, it will go as high as 2,500 ppm in the average bedroom. And Johnson, uh, Jacobson at all indicated, oh, even as high as 1,000, there must be some sort of sleep disturbance and health issues in the bedroom. So as a Riordo uh, researcher in hospitality management, I am so pleased to learn something from this workshop because if I present this type of study to hospitality management, I can get as many uh, audience as other hospitality management uh, uh, researchers. So I'm not going to cover the, what CO2 is because I'm sure that you know more than I do. CO2 is indoor CO2 is human respiration. And the reason that I like to give you the uh, CDC recommendation letter because we just went out of the COVID and CDC recommends indoor CO2 level should be 800 ppm or lower. Um, I travel everywhere I go um, with a small device uh, sponsoring my research, OAir, and OAir is the only one uh, manufacturer, low quality, low quality sensor uh, invited by um, Harrison, oh, Biden and Harrison administration when they had 
first Hindu Pali summit uh, back in 2022. And I told Yang and uh, Chair Wu how fancy this building is because occupancy of this uh, auditorium room is more than half though. Uh, the field to concentration is 800 level. That is what CDC uh, recommends to minimize infectious uh, transmission risks in indoor space. So indoor CO2 is a uh, proxy for respiratory infectious uh, transmission risk. That's what uh, CDC tried to recommend indoor building operator or owners to maintain CO2 level. Uh, those hotels that I traveled and take conduct uh, field tasks. The most recent one was in New York City. I brought my research team and then had a three different teams with, paired with a two gas, three gas, and then four gas there. And then I used my OAIR, uh, the product, and set it uh, in each guest room where the two, three, or uh, four gas slept through the night. And the actual uh, field test that our research team conducted was in August 2023, a few months after this disaster. The one particular reason that I brought my team to New York City after the Canadian wildfire, because I believe it in hotels in New York City, just like five or four, not five stars, four star or higher have done something to protect their guests to sleeping through the night because recently they had a wildfire smoke capture the entire city. So this is the actual hotel that I brought my research team into. Uh, I don't I don't like to say their name, but you can see the name of the hotel on the screen. And this is the rooftop bar, the fancy one. And then this is the uh, the room, the same room, the standard room that three teams stayed all together. So this is where that I put OAIR on me there, on the right next to the TV, and then measured indoor air quality parameters, not only temperature, humidity, but also CO2, VOCs, and PM 2.5. OAIR uh, takes five minute average into a uh, cloud system and stores it. And because of uh, my uh, status at that hotel, I was able to request a uh, late checkout, but one room was denied. So that's what, why the one room had only 232 samples and other two rooms, I had more samples um, to the OAIR there. So here is the uh, CO2 uh, trends overnight. So this is the recommended level, 800 ppm, throughout from the check-in to check-out. Schramm and Tietzen recommended, oh, CO2 level in bedroom should be less than 1,150. And as you can see, one primary portion of the line chart indicates the slipping, the guests in each room, two, three, or four guests. Can anyone imagine why there is a period that lower than recommended level? I, we were all out of the room for dinner. But once we came back, the CO2 level went right up and hovering around 2000 ppm until the morning, uh, we went out for a breakfast there. And this is the uh, Room 804 that has a triple uh, three gas state there and 800 ppm is recommended level. This is the trend. And of course, uh, four gas there 
the same thing above 800 level over in 2000 ppm there without the customers or guests noticing that the sleep quality uh, compromised we couldn't feel that whether our sleep quality was compromised but maybe my body react to that CO2 level high more than uh, 2000 ppm throughout the night. And I had a simple uh, descriptive, descriptive uh, statistical analysis. As you can see here, while sleeping eight hours, minimum, maximum, quartile, all the samples went above 800 ppm. And while occupying few hours and our team uh, spent few hours watching TV, getting some work done, and we had total two and three higher than 800 ppm. And out of room, the reason that out of room still uh, higher than 800 ppm, because I counted when we walked out, that is the period started the outer room. That is a lingering effect that we came out of room from sleeping or from occupying. And uh, CO2 uh, distribution, as you can see here, when sleeping, doesn't matter how many occup uh, guests occupied in the room, all three uh, uh, rooms, those customers, our team members slept through the night, must have their sleep quality impacted and compromised. And even while occupying, our breath respiratory uh, CO2 built up in the gas room that lingers through the night as we exhale sleeping through the night. So the conclusion, I have, because I, my time is only 15 minutes, I have several slides, in particular those air quality parameters that I measured last night when we all had dinner together. And here, one thing that I may make you feel gross is that uh, Rodney and Milton's re-breath fraction model. The average that, as you can see here, the sleeping, almost 2,000, right, between 2,000 and uh, 2,500, based on the average that reported sleeping through the night, one breath out of 40 breaths. So we typically breathe 25 uh, breaths a minute. So every two minute breath, breathing, one breath is completely someone else's. If we share this space, the air that you breathe, that has been in my lungs. The air that I breathe has been your own lung that we are sharing our breath all together. Yes, families, it's fine, but total strangers. <laughs> so I will show you the indoor air quality measurement that I collected last night for two hour long period that we ate dinner. I, by the way, I love their food. My favorite food is ceviche. Uh, it's my first time that the tenderness of the, uh, the fish they cooked through the, the line and acid was fantastic. But when I, so here, this is the device there. Uh, Sotorius is there, right, uh, uh, set in front of me. And I don't think the Brandon is here. Uh, he left. Uh, he left. And uh, Bob left as well. So Bob sit, uh, this is my seat and then Bob sat right next to me and chair, ooh, sat right here, all right? So about six of us shared our breath together. <laughs> this is the temperature, uh, rel uh, uh, our relative humidity, nothing unusual. 
a little bit uh, higher in relative humidity in them because of the rain yesterday. And this is PM 2.5. Uh, Karen, no issue at all. Uh, uh, but VOC, uh, chemicals, I can't imagine what two spikes there around 715 or 730. One limitation of a low quality uh, sensor in terms of VOC uh, readings, even this machine picks up uh, the, the aroma from the wine or margaritas or even the lime from the food. So uh, I doubt that it will actually impact our health or those who are so on uh, with me, but here is CO2 level. So I said that 800 ppm is the proxy level for uh, low infectious transmission risk. Higher than that, the chances will go higher. The CO2 level uh, started about uh, 1,200 ppm and then fumarine up until the 1,400 ppm. So at least based on the good next, the model, we breast uh, model, we shared at least one breast out of 50 during the one hour and 30 minutes, our dinner all together then. So ultimately what I like to do with my research is to help Marriott, Delton, and Hyatt create indoor environment their customers refresh just like outside 400 ppm and then get a refresh the sleep through the night and then go out get their business done or have fun uh, with the family specifically in miami south beach or in orlando so that they can have a full day fun day and then get rejuvenated their health and immune system surfing through the night with 400 or a little up, up until 800 ppm CO2 level in the gas. Okay, thank you for my presentation. Have you heard it? That was a great way to uh, end these presentations. Um, did you want to chance did you get people to be sitting up here? I think that's not a I thought you were fascinating. They, they were all fascinating. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that. Um, are there any questions from, okay, there's one in the back there. Yeah, um, I've got two questions for the speakers. Okay. Um, you characterized the last physical and my understanding is that Combination of PM two point five, PM ten, etc. Have you looked at the chemical characterization to be able to tell exactly which chemical if any is affecting the system? Yes. So we know dust contain different elemental composition that are common uh, in dust particles, but there are some differences from sort to source. Um. um we have not looked at that yet, but yes, we are planning to link between the composition of the particles to the health. I can tell you for the, the last slide I had for the African dust, we did that for cell population, which is not the single cell, this is what Gloria will do. And we did find, or say, we couldn't find a correlation that would say the elemental composition was of this, had more toxicity compared to this. Um, 
but we're hoping that with the single cell particles, we will be able to tune in to a fine aspect. And also we're now looking at pure material. We have different types of clays and we found that they have different chemical composition and also they have a different toxicity. Yeah. So we're hoping this will help us to pinpoint to what makes the particle toxic. Why some dust is toxic compared to others? But we don't have an answer yet. The other question is for Dr. Lee. Are you sure to detect ammonia or amines you use uh, protonated ammonia? I wanted to know how do you protonate your use for purposes of if I understand it, is that you are asking me how I made a protonated ammonia and amines? Exactly, to detect the amines. Yes. So basically, react with uh, ammonia molecules, react with protonated uh, ethanols. So protonated ethanols has a lower proton affinity than ammonia. So the protons will transfer from ethanol to ammonia. Did you do something to your ethanol? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. 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 So I transferred the uh, ethanol vapors uh, mixed with the nitrogen into the polonium 210. Um, I have a couple of questions also. The first one for Dr. Arden Dreyer. I'm wondering, I've lived in the desert for a lot of my life. I was getting kind of stressed during your presentation. So what would you say, you know, to people who live in areas that are affected by dust events and to also, you know, like policymakers in those areas? Um, what should be people be doing to take care of their health? Because you mentioned some really scary repercussions. Yes. So the biggest thing is stay indoor. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly your coffee is in your. So the thing is, try to stay, make sure the air quality in your house is good. Um, let, me, let me tell you about the, during COVID, we had dust in, in Lubbock, and I had the sensor indoor, and I saw dust in my house, like in my living room. So we're doomed. You know. um, stay indoor if you can, because the exposure to the concentration of particle will be small. Make sure you have good windows. Um, my house is all needs so we need to change those things. Uh, but if you can, you know, change. If you have to go outside, wear a mask. You know, try, if you know you have asthma, if you know you already have health problems. If you're going to be outside and exposed, it's just going to aggravate and you're going to fill them. So be smart, have a mask, cover your nose, your mouth uh, to make sure they're not going to go in. Your body will try to clean them anyway. That's why you're coughing. That's why you have mucus. So that's a normal mechanism. But you know, try to reduce them. Um, what was the other part of the question? What can we do? So oh, the policy, yes. yes. So it's a hard one. Because, and, and it's one thing I'm now sort of, I don't want to say fight, but like I'm trying to open the eyes. Dust doesn't consider as a problem in the US and it doesn't take seriously. So we just had a paper published uh, uh, last month in GeoHealth um, where we say, hey people, there's a problem. You need to think about it. Uh, and we highlight several issues, and, and we're hoping, you know, policymakers will start to look at dust as an issue. All the regulation, EPA, World Health Organization, they're based for anthropogenic emissions. They're not for dust. So we're now, you know, we're hoping, I'm hoping that with data, we will be able to show that we need to maybe look at that impact in a different way. And we might need to even look at the health impact in a different way, like the short exposure, something that you know we're trying to bring to the table. So that's just problematic in the US, not just, but you know, it's really not considered as a, as a problem. Or you'd like to say it's being uh it's under the radar. I also had a question for Dr. Ching. So you showed those levels, you know, carbon dioxide in the rooms were higher than ideal. Um, you know, what do you tell to the hotel after that? Like, what are they doing to get those levels to be um, lowered? 
I have uh, discussed my the results of my five years of study uh, investigating the indoor air quality, the hotel rooms that I stayed. I have talked to corporate Mary and uh, vice president of the corporate uh, facility management was very interested in pursuing uh, collaboration, how Marriott hotels can bring down the CO2 level during the COVID. Once we done with COVID, with CDC no longer, uh, COVID is the national emergency, they stopped communicating with me because now they don't think that, um, why they, am I digging the hole that no one is uh, wanted to learn more? So we stopped collaborating uh, since then because they don't like to uh, raise the issue that may would may make their customers concerned with indoor air quality. But uh, I'm sure uh, one brand that uh, changed the way that hospitality, in particular lodging industry, transformed. For example, uh, those generation like mine, uh, when we believe that how do we enhance the sleep quality, uh, entrepreneur uh, Barry Sterling, who uh, was a founder and uh, CEO of Starwood Hotels and Resort, he created Heavenly Bed. Heavenly Bed only exclusive for Western Hotel. Have you all heard of Heavenly Bed before? Mm -hmm. It was back in the 1990s when four or five staff wanted to attract more customers, Barry Stanley created Heavenly Bed that made exclusively by Simmons, I guess, I believe the Simmons, the, the mattress company, uh, created Heavenly Bed only for a Westie Hotel. Those customers spent the night in that mattress, ordered through Westie and then delivered it to their house. So now every major hotel brands have their exclusive metrics line to make the customers uh, satisfied with the metrics. So I think that Barry Stanley is the, the person that will make the indoor air quality a lot better than anybody else that help customers sleep well with the metrics that he designed back in the 1990s, 1990s. So that's what I am aiming at uh, collaborating with. Uh, now we have a Miami, Barry Sterling is leading the brand name of One Hotel. So that is the uh, hotel brand that he is nurturing because he was kicked out of his company that he built, uh, just like his Steve Jobs years ago. So that is one hope uh, as a researcher helping the industry expand the service level that they haven't provided uh, in the first place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also have a question for Dr. Lee. Um, my my major concern is always with waste. Uh, so when you mentioned about uh, sulfuric acid and ammonium being part of the particle formation, um, it got my mind into the landfill and wastewater treatment facilities. Do you have numbers concerning specifically those areas with like areas near landfills and wastewater treatment facilities, they are more impacted by new particle formations or? I know, did you know? Yeah, that's very interesting point. So yes, actually it's interesting because uh, those facilities produce lots of ammonia, I mean, so, yes. And it's always like a fight where to place them. Population mm -hmm. like or is like pushing them to other people's backyards. So that yes. also be a yes. Yes, in in developed countries, yes, but uh, in, in developing countries, uh, basically, I mean, ammonia, the main sources in urban sites is, uh, you know, those uh, safety. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yes, it's very crazy, very crazy, yes. But uh, uh, to my knowledge, there is no specific uh, new type formation studies uh, targeting on land for uh, those uh, water treatment, that is very good point. Because water is also, when we do water treatment, we use uh, 
uh, polymers to get rid of all those bacteria, but that polymer polymers are made up by amines. So they eventually also produce amines, ammonia inside too. So if you drink water, you always drink some of ammonia amines there. Mm -hmm. So very good point. Thank you. Thank you. I saw a question there and then go ahead. Thank you. So uh, thanks, thanks for the great presentation. So I have a question to to, to, to Dr. Chin. So uh, I'm I'm thinking about it that so the, the in the indoor air quality. So has there been like the work works or like reports on the carbon dioxide levels in inside the car? Because I think the so the, the, the carbon dioxide level in the car may, may be even more important and maybe like even more like dangerous yes. for, for 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 like uh, car operations because it will like uh, if the driver feels drowsy it will be, be directly related to the risks. Exactly, you brought up the uh, the great point. Um, the area and the time that we expose the highest CO two level is inside your car. And imagine that you probably sat on an Uber uh, car and came here 30 minute ride. If you ask that driver to change the air mode from indoor and outdoor, bringing a fresh air, other than that, you will sharing the breath with the driver <laughs> to the ride. Uh, the level that I monitored highest was inside my own car that reaches almost 5,000 level. If you don't pay attention to the air blowing in with that fresh air, that's how much CO2 level built up uh, over time. And whenever I had a Uber ride, I asked a driver to turn off the circulation mode and then turn in a fresh air mode. Some driver asked me to please, do not, this, the tailpipe uh, air pollutant is coming in, but I don't mind inhaling the uh, NO2 or other nasty one, because I don't like to sharing breath uh, with the driver there. <laughs> so it's a great point. Uh, another point that I like to make with all the audience here, because I measured indoor air quality, not only the area that I travel, but inside my place. Uh, we all do have the uh, small appliance. I'm sure that all of you have uh, air fryer, how convenient it is. Have you measured the air coming out of the air, air fryer that you put in some uh, small uh, fries there or anything like that? Uh, you will see how crazy your indoor air quality monitor uh, going through the roof. And if you fry the egg in the morning to uh, quick fix without having your fan on, and if you didn't pay attention to how uh, oil burning it up, you are inhaling PM 2.5, PM 10, and then VOCs entirely in your lawn all day long because it will kept in your lawn for all day once you inhale it in the morning. So vent, open up the window, and have your fan running right above your uh, stove, then the minimum, the exposure will be minimized. So this means that the e EPA may even need to like, like, the, like the, the very recommend to set, set up the carbon dioxide level sensor in each car. Exactly. I mean, it's a $100, $200 worth of small uh, uh, unit, then we can set it anywhere and then see uh, how bad or good it is. Then it will help our health better than uh, uh, it was. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, question over there and then you. So I guess it's kind of a multifaceted one also for Dr. John. And that is, have you begun, since you said you, started research this for the last couple of years. Have you kind of classified the kind of hotels you've stayed in? Because there are some hotels that where the room literally like the door between the room can also can just directly lead outside or you could have a hallway like multiple floors up. Mm -hmm. Have you kind of classified 
like the kind of hotels you've stayed in and kind of recorded the carbon dioxide levels from each one? Yes. Uh, one hotel brand that uh, I worked with uh, was Drury Hotel. I don't think that not many people have heard that brand name, Drury Hotel. That is a uh, select service chain uh, hotel uh, uh, originated from Missouri or Kansas somewhere. And the, the founder of that Drury Hotel wanted to bring uh, fresh air to each room of the hotel, spending more money routing fresh air from the uh, top uh, rooftop unit down to every single floor. Because the construction cost to having each route to each room to fresh air is expensive. But the founder of the Drury brand believed it in. He, the founder wanted to uh, provide fresh air to each single room. And I wonder why they haven't promoted uh, to the audience, to their uh, loyal customers, because they have done that way for a long time. And then the founder passed away and the, uh, the president of the brand didn't see the value that would make customers pay a little bit more or stay longer at all. But that is the one hotel, not Drury Suite and Inn, only Drury Plaza Hotel has done that way. So that is the one uh, thing that I can tell for sure. If you stay Drury Plaza Hotel, then CO2 level will be a lot lower because fresh air supplied in each room that you stay. Interesting. And have you stayed in a hotel room where the CO2 levels were actually near where they should be? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, it's not the hotels on the ground. It was a hotel on a ship. Hmm. So cruise is the one that made the CO2 level below 800 with four of family, for four, my family slept for three nights in a row. So because the building code and ship code, building code is only require a certain CFM on the floor, not each room, but crews. The code of each room should be supplied fresh air. Downside of the supplying fresh air in the room, you will get a noise. The fan keep blowing fresh air into the room, and then one point that where that the air going out. So it's constant noise uh, that you have to sleep through. So that is the one downside that having CO2 level under 815. So I hope that I answered your question. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you so much for the presentation. I have a question for Dr. Harden. Uh, and it's been that cells got overwhelmed and the high concentration of the dust, and they eventually got died. So, did you find a threshold of dust concentration regarding the cell viability? Also, are you planning to do any dosimetric analysis? Yeah, so it's really early, early stage uh, of, of our finding. We're still developing and trying to find um, what is the concentration. And we think that it's every particle, because of the different chemistry, it might have a different threshold. What we saw is that as you increase the dose, you would have more of the explosion, more of the forces, which will cause inflammation but i can add and i don't think i mentioned it it's not just impacting the cell that they're done it's also impacting those who remain alive we see that even cell that remain alive are being stressed and we see that because they're dividing less and less and the time between revision is becoming slower and slower and they're getting stressed and getting into a stage that they're sort of not dividing even anymore as we increase the dose. So it's it's multi-aspect, but what exactly is the threshold? What is the key point? When, you know, exactly what is, is it mineralogy? Is it elemental composition? Is it biological particle that are attached to the dust, which is something that we know happened? We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. so. I think Marcus had a question. Yes. Has, um, question. 
have a question for Dr. Lee. I would like to ask you if you can check in on the uh, association between cloud types and part information. Oh, that is a very big question. I don't know anyone knows the answer. That is a very big question. Maybe you should write a proposal. <laughs> Maybe that would be a good PhD proposal. Well, during Tracer in Houston, did you see a correspondence? Oh, uh, yeah. We didn't pay much, so much attention to uh, cloud. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is a tracer's key objective to see the aerosol effects on convection and thus to the, uh, you know, the cloud formation. To be honest, I'm doing very molecular level of work. <laughs> very molecular level of studies. So, um, yes, eventually that is the reason I wanted to collaborate with the one to link uh, my molecular level studies to the, the climate uh, through CCN information. Mm -hmm. That's why I want, what I want to kind of collaborate with you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget IMP also. They're very important to know. Yeah, I've got another question for Dr. Wang. Uh, I don't know. So it's very interesting that we're able to show us the um, Death mechanism of cells. So my question, I was curious to know how we able to show the video. Did you have a high resolution camera, or you what did you need to generate uh, the clip? And also, I heard from the post session that it's very tedious the single cell analysis. That have you thought about an online or an automated way of running this as fast as possible? So it's a Nikon system, inverted system, super expensive. It's like almost two hundred thousand dollars just a microscope. Um, we take images every fifteen minutes, and as I think we we talked, we go back to the exact location every fifteen minutes and we take the image, so we can follow. We will create movies over time, and we take videos for forty eight hours, seventy two hours. Um, we take videos in bright field, which is the, the regular light, and also with light uh, for the filter that we use for the fluorescent to see the cells. So we don't want to take more frequent because that's toxic to the cells. But we do want to take not, not less than, than 15, but not more than 15, because we found it's like a good time to look for division, to look for cell depth. Because the cell might die if you take an image every hour. You, you might, you know, you're not gonna see the cells anymore. Um there is Nikon cell, an automated system, costs twenty thousand dollars. We don't have that kind of money anymore. Uh now we have any startup, so but we know it's not perfect. So you have to be trained to do that. So I know Gloria has been taking a long time, she just started doing the tracking. It takes a long time at the beginning, and you have to be very careful because it's it's statistical analysis. So you want to be sure you're saying a cell died, it actually died. Um, maybe with AI, you can train the computer to do it, but everything in science costs money. <laughs> sure. um, my question for Dr. Alindra, so keeping the mass constant, What's going to be more harmful for the cell? Small size particles or the large size particles? It's a good question because if you look at the literature, some papers showing high toxicity with coarse particles. Some papers show that, well, we know anthropogenic is way more toxic because these are much smaller. There is small particle in the dust. I'm not sure it's the dust. Yes, it's okay. I would, I would also say that composition is also the yes, same. Yes, yes. And it could be heavy metal, um, maybe some biological material could cut. We still don't know. And we're hoping once we have enough samples with different diversity of chemistry, different diversity of, we do play with size. We, we, we do expose the cells to core size and, and fine size, and we do some differences. But 
I feel like it's way more complex than that. And this method is sort of in the beginning. So I'm hoping, you know, with more experiment, more sample, we have sample from all over the world, we might be able to like fine tune and find the, the cost. Okay. Ask me if any. <laughs> I have a follow up question then. How you introduce the particles to yourself? So, the way that we do it uh, is we use mass, which is another whole thing by itself. Okay. Um, I would love to try to correlate the mass to concentration that we see in, in, in the air, but we, we, we still need to play with that to find like what's the fine tuning or because we use mass for PM. We, we quantify it based on mass per cubic, uh, uh, background per cubic centimeter. Um, so we add the particle known mass into a media, and then we do a series of dilutions. So we go from a control which has no particles, that's our basic, that's our baseline, and then we normally double the concentration. And the concentration we, we use are similar to what other people have done, so we will, we'll be able to have some comparison. <laughs> I have a question with Dr. Lee. Um, so like China in the past decade used a lot of smoke tower, right? Um, so like they're taking in particles to clean the air. So are there any studies which say that let's like let's say the smoke towers are running, so they are capturing in those particles. So do you also see the decrease in VOCs or means which are in the gaseous space? Like, could that help? Um, in the new particle formation. Interesting. As far as I know in China, SO2 decreasing, but uh, ammonia still increasing. Mm -hmm. There are not so many data on amines. All these amines are very difficult to measure. So ammonia are still increasing. But uh, the question is, uh, the future studies always, uh, you have to take into consideration temperature, you know, if you have more temperature, of course, ammonia more emitted. But uh, I think still sulfuric acid is the most important precursor. So because it's a SO2, as long as SO2 decreases, I think new part formation is the nucleation rates will be decreasing along that if only we compare emissions of ammonia, amines, and the SO2. But we should not also forget the ponds as well, because if we increase temperature, you know, biogenically or anthropogenically, we also produce more VOCs. So yes, I, I hope I partially answered your question. So one question over there. Let's take that the last one. And, uh, we're still on question for uh, Karim. By the way, thank you so much for the fantastic presentations. And uh, I bet you have one um, best teaching award. <laughs> if not, you know, shame But very, very fascinating. I feel like I'm a uh, you know in my undergrad uh, classroom. Uh, you know, amazed by the answer. You know, the teaching is is. Uh, very excellent. Thank you. Um, my questions are, are related for one to the, the dust storm, another to the, the cells, I guess, the, the dust. So the dust storm, uh, you mentioned the source could be from uh, anywhere all over the globe. But uh, it's the first time I heard that Aruba has this uh, storm, but I have been in college station for almost 10 it's years. But your I, way, by the way. I, okay, now maybe I am not, I, I don't know, I haven't experienced such storm in college station, maybe, I don't know, 200 miles or 300 miles from Aruba to college station. So, so can I explain why, I mean, or how, what the raging of the dust will form on why it's going to Aruba but not going to college station? Well, it, it does go. We have some the the big uh, uh, convective synoptic event that I showed from 2021. We monitored that event. It went all the way to Houston from Lubbock, all the way. It made it. It made to Houston at 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, the area of where I'm from, which is West Texas, have a lot of agriculture. And we also have a lot of desert sort of teaching on the desert and, and uh, other area 
uh, with the border of Mexico. So we have the source, dry land. So source is one thing, whether we need wind, we have a lot of wind in West Texas. We have great wind energy. Um, so we have those two components. Now we need a meteorological condition that will cause the wind that will blow the sand from the dry soil. And we have those low pressure and we have those convective events that can cause that. Um, I haven't analyzed yet, but I'm in a process of doing it to see how many of the dust from, from West Texas making it way all the way to Houston. But we do have records showing that it does. But we, we have measurement and you see all the way Dallas increase, San Antonio increase, and then like seven in the morning, you made it to Houston. Um, so it, it's, it's coming your way. <laughs> uh, sorry, the second question though is the is, is the video in the south in the south that you're talking about the dust and oh. then they burst. Wow, that's that's scary. So, but what happened to the wind afterward? The debris, you know, do they, the other cells can take the, the dust again or, or so on the plate? Nothing. On the plate, the minute the cell dies, it disattaches from the plate and basically it's floating in the medium. In our body, we do have cells that's supposed to clean those dead cells and any fungi and bacteria that you get into your lungs. They call microphages. So in our body, we do have cells that's supposed to come and they're sort of the, the human vacuum cleaner. They'll come and they'll take those particles and take the dead cells and digest them and, and take them to the trash so they won't be toxic. When it comes to uh, a time when you have so much particle in the air, which means you have a lot of particles that get into your lungs, those microphages are overwhelmed. And according to the literature, we know that their efficient <clears throat> is reduced. So they're not cleaning as efficient and they as they should have. So that's why we do have some cell who die who still don't get cleaned. So we get some of inflammation in our body because this material from the cell released into the bloodstream. So you do you want to close with any remarks? Or? Yes. Uh, so first, thank the panelists uh, for the wonderful session. But actually, yes. Uh, a very important uh, activity um, is uh, the uh, student uh, um, award, Oxford and the uh, student team. We have a little bit of it. Oh, yes, sorry. So uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining the uh, second uh, uh, workshop uh, for uh, summer school in winter for aerosol science technology at the University of Miami. And uh, we started on uh, Wednesday with uh, the tutorials and uh, the yesterday focusing on nanoparticle technology and the instrument demo. And today we move to the uh, public health and the dust uh, um, effects. Um, um, so I hope you enjoy the uh, mix of uh, different themes and also see the connections that we can uh, learn from one to the other. And uh, um, now I would like to uh, close this uh, uh, workshop. And uh, first I would like to thank the uh, sponsors, uh, industrial sponsors uh, who help us to uh, you know, provide the resources to run the uh, workshop. And also, I want to uh, thank the organizers, especially uh, Dr. Zhao Yuli and uh, uh, Dr. Yang Wang. Uh, if you like anything, please tell them. And uh, if anything goes wrong, please talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and also like to thank, thank the uh, session chairs and the speakers uh, for your wonderful presentations. And uh, also, we shouldn't forget about students. Students have done a wonderful job in uh, helping organizing all different activities. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank every participant, including the uh, in-person and also the online participants. Uh, and uh, because with you, we can have this uh, uh, workshop. So finally, I would like to, to uh, thank you and uh, I hope uh, to, uh, I would like to, to uh, invite you to come back to, for the third uh, workshop uh, uh, in 2025 back in here. And thank you very much. <laughs>